What's going on, everybody? Hopefully, y'all should know the drill. Let me know that you can hear me okay. <clears throat> and see, I already got a packed house tonight. This is awesome. All right, sounds like I'm good to go. I see a couple of uh, familiar names from the last not-so-good uh, live stream, but this one's going to be um, a whole lot better. At least I hope it's going to be a whole lot better. We're going to have a we're going to have a lot more fun. I just looked back um, at my last few live streams and saw that it's been it's been about two months since I last um, reviewed any of my APA matches. And as I reviewed three of my APA matches last time and then slowly but surely started clipping them out um, of the live stream and then just posting them uh, separately for anybody to view that wasn't uh, there uh, during the live stream. <clears throat> so we're pretty much gonna do the, uh, the same exact thing. Now, um, before we get started, um, I can see that there are 41 uh, viewers um, in here, and I only have 12 likes um, for the live stream. So if y'all could just do me a big favor and just hit that thumbs up uh, for the live stream. And let's, let's try to keep the likes um, at a 50% ratio. So there's, I currently see roughly 40 people so let's at least get the likes up to to 20 it helps the algorithm out it helps get my live stream um out there so hopefully more people can start discovering and we can all learn and have fun and dissect these uh these uh matches that i have uh together so we can all uh learn because i'm not just going to be teaching everybody you know we're going to be reading some comments we're going to be drawing all over the uh the matches and stuff and figure out like how I could have done things better, how maybe my opponents could have done things better or whatever. Just something so that everybody here in the room and myself and then anybody that watches the live streams or anybody that watches the uh, matches when I clip them out to hopefully learn and benefit. Now, as I was prepping <clears throat> this live stream, I did notice that I automatically started with a, or I had a question already lined up, um, and this comes from Chris. And he says he's starting um, his APA league in four weeks, and he wants to know if he has any, if I have any words of wisdom uh, that he should know as a beginning APA league member. He's got a couple of good um, answers. Um, Steve Dosh, I hope I pronounced that right, um, gave some pretty good advice about how a skilled position um, and defensive player um, almost, I love that you put almost always, wins over a ball banger because that you couldn't have said that any better right because i mean just sometimes the a ball banger can actually pull out a victory even over a um a skilled uh, defensive player um what i'm gonna say uh to hopefully try to help you out chris is what i always tell my apa teammates and that is to stay within your skill set um, when you're in your matches um you know usually um, you're constantly working on things every day, and there are things that you're good at, and there are things that you're not so good at, and that's why you practice them. Well, when you're in your matches, you kind of don't want to really try anything that you're working on unless it's an absolute last resort. Uh, because more times than not, you might end up failing. There could be those rare occasions to where you might pull off the Hail Mary shot that you haven't been able to execute in practice, and all of a sudden you, you manage to pull it off uh, at the critical moment in one of your league matches. That's certainly a possibility. But there's also the possibility that more times than not, it might fail. So if you at least stay within your skill set and do things that you're very comfortable doing inside of your league matches, that should at least hopefully tell you that you played your best. And if you still play your best and end up losing, you either got outplayed by somebody better, which should be perfectly fine, or there is the possibility that you did lose the luck against a ball banger. That one could be a little bit more frustrating uh, to take a loss like that. But if you're getting outplayed by an opponent when you're playing your best, that should be a loss uh, that you should be okay with. 
And just as um, Steve said, no matter what, if you win or lose your match, you should always learn from it. Um, in my last live stream, I gave an example of if you're doing a race to five and you manage to win uh, your match five to four, it's obviously great and wonderful that you got the win. But you really should study and learn why did your opponent get four racks, right? It, without just simply saying because you missed, right? That that don't don't ever try to say well if I would have just made that shot then I, I I wouldn't have lost the rack like that that's always going to be like a default answer as to why you as to why you lose a rack. Try to dig a little bit deeper and really really try to find all the uh, the nooks and crannies as to what causes you to lose a rack on every single solitary shot. Work on trying to fix those as time goes by, and then start winning matches five to two, five to one, five to zero. You know, and it, your 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 goal is really to beat your opponents to where they're either winning no games against you or maybe one or two. And of course, every now and again, it'll be a little bit closer. Sometimes you'll run up against those hill hill matches. But whether you're winning or whether you're losing, always look at the racks that you lost and really try to figure out where were the pivotal moments where you could have done something a little bit different that would have changed the results or that could have changed the results of the of the rack. So I hope that makes sense. Now, let's go down the list here because I see that we have Craig. We got, like I said, Steve Dosh. I hope I uh, pronounced that uh, correctly. We got my buddy Roopster760, Sco uh, Scooper JS, uh, Zach Smith, um, Paul G. Uh, what is this? Slime Pig. We got Last Dime Taker, Timothy Majors, uh, WM uh, Mazak, my boy, Mr. Edit One, uh, Ron, the pool student. All kinds of wonderful people in here. Eric G, Eric Pool Guy Simpson uh, 29. Man, the list just goes on and on and on. If I missed a name, I do apologize. NZ uh, Detecting Discoveries. I remember you from the uh, the last live stream. Let's see. Who else do we got in here? Uh, Andrew Gagnon. Thanks for being here. Cue ball control sometimes. Ron Johnson. 100% bow hunter. Todd Elston. How's everybody doing? This is fan-freaking-tastic. Dana from the practice room. Good to see you. Cal Patty 15 Awesome, rad zero nine. It's like I can't really just a a ask for anything better here. This is awesome. <clears throat> oh, cool! I, I did pronounce it. I, I said Dosh, right? So I, I did pronounce that correctly. Awesome. It's like I'm always <laughs> I'm always worried about uh, mispronouncing uh, someone's last name because that's 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 going to happen from time to time. So as I said. Um, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be looking at three of my APA eight ball matches. And so what we're going to do um, is I'm going to switch over to this because this is the first match that we're going to look at. We're going to dissect. We're going to watch the match, obviously. We're going to dissect the match um, and then, like I said, try to figure out things where I could have done a little bit better. Uh, maybe try to um, offer some advice to my opponent in case they happen to uh, catch the live stream, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, allow everybody uh, to be able to learn something uh, from this match. Now, um, if you read the description, um, these are still matches that come from the summer 2021 session. So these are the last three that I have to cover, actually. And then I'm done with all of the summer 2021 uh, matches. And then I only have a few um, fall uh, 2021 um, matches um, because th this fall has been a little rough for me. I don't know if y'all remember when I got a little sick and uh, that actually carried on um, a little bit um, and caused me to miss a couple of matches for both APA and, and BCA. But And we're getting ready to wrap up uh, this current session and roll into playoffs. And so we don't know for um, if we're even going to make playoffs uh, this session. Uh, but if we do happen to draw the wild card, then maybe we can still um, pull something off. But then we're obviously preparing for the next uh, spring 2022 uh, session. I'm actually reconstructing uh, the teams because um, uh, if anybody remembers that when I went to Las Vegas, I didn't even get to play uh, because our roster was just so top heavy. Too many of my players had gone up. Um, and I ended up just being a coach. So we pretty much had to dismantle the team that we had. We split it apart. We're actually uh, creating two separate teams. Um, I'm going to be on one of them, and then a lot of my um, higher skill level uh, teammates are, are going to help uh, captain and co-captain uh, the other one as we fill those uh, teams back up. So 
in this matchup here, I'm going to be playing up against another skill level 7. Uh, so hopefully you should be able to see the little scoreboard that I have here. It is going to be a race to 5. And we're now at a point in the league where we are lagging. We're no longer um, coin flipping. I think sometimes uh, uh, two, uh, two players might decide to still do a coin flip, but most of the time we're still supposed to be doing um, lags um, in this one. And you should also see that we're, uh, we're not wearing any masks. Um, either so we don't we don't really have any mask mandates um, here in Texas um, everything uh, is is back to normal um, as as it can be so without any further ado um, I'll be trying to go back and forth between uh, the live chat to be able to answer questions there'll be certain moments uh, where we'll try to do like an analysis breakdown of things that could actually happen or things uh, that we could have tried differently or whatever. So that way this is a little bit more of an interactive uh, live stream rather than me just trying to commentate um, as to what's happening in the match. And just like before, since this is eight ball, it's a little bit easier uh, to try to keep control of the cue ball diagram and let y'all know what type of spins I might be doing uh, for particular shots, provided of course, that I can remember what in the world I was doing um, on some of these shots. But when it is my opponent's turn, I'll just have the cue ball diagram uh, return back to the center and then kind of just maybe guess what the um, opponent might be doing. So with that in mind, let's begin. So we are going to lag. Let's see how the lag goes. And it looks like I won the lag. So we are going to try to kill the downtime. So like when uh, the uh, balls are being racked and stuff, we'll just kind of fast forward. Now, during the summer 2021 uh, session, this is when I was uh, I start my matches off by doing the classic break uh, where I'm just trying to hit the head ball. And then when I get on the hill, I do try to go for an eight ball break. So if I do the classic break, I do try to have a little bit of top spin. Um, on the cue ball as I hit that head ball and I try to get the cue ball to squat near the center of the table. But if you saw on this break here, my cue ball kind of goes off to the left and then starts to drift up. So I didn't hit the head ball as square as I possibly could. Um, and that's why the cue ball is at where it's at. Now, um, I did see that I dropped a ball. What is on the table? Uh, let's see. Two, four, six, seven. Looks like I'm solid. I think I see three stripes on the table. So actually, you know what? Let's go ahead and stop here because you see what I'm already doing. Uh, these are things that I always typically do on any match, whether it's eight ball or nine ball. Um, I am scoping out the entire table before I even decide to play my first ball. If anybody is looking at this uh, table here, what is the only issue that I have on the table? And hopefully everybody should see that it's the eight ball. The eight ball really doesn't go anywhere if I'm going to try to run out um, solid. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, so I, I'm going to be solid since I made a solid on the break. But every other ball is fine. So what I would hope that I tried to do, at least in this rack here, is figure out some sort of pattern that is going to allow me to break out the eight ball and then be able to win the game if I even did um, break and run this rack. I honestly don't remember if I did or if I didn't. So let's see what I do. <clears throat> Judging by where I'm standing, even though you can't really see it because the scoreboard's in the way, it looks like I'm eyeballing the six ball and I can see that I have a little bit of topspin um, on the cue ball. It makes me feel like I'm going to try to cut the six ball into the side pocket and kind of just drift forward either for the four ball or the one ball. Looks actually I have more topspin than that. Okay, so that drifted down further than I probably would have liked, but still no big deal because I do have my shot on the one ball and I do have a shot at the uh, four ball. There it looks like I might have been checking to see if the two ball passes the nine, at least from this camera angle, it doesn't look like it. Now it looks like I'm squaring up for the one ball. I might have a little bit of below center and probably just a touch of right spin. So when I come off that side reel, I spin right back towards the middle of the table. 
this should allow me to shoot the two ball into the bottom left corner pocket. Um, if anything, this is probably done again with a little bit of bottom right because I probably want the cue ball to hit the side rail and then spin into the nine ball so that way my cue ball doesn't really go anywhere. Kind of like that. But I end, I end up missing the shot. So if anything, if I would have made that, y'all can see that I have the five ball to go into the uh, same corner pocket and I would have to try to use the four ball to get some sort of position on the eight ball, maybe for the right side pocket or maybe for the, the bottom right corner pocket. But let's see what my opponent does. He is wasting no time as he takes that stripe out. Coming down table now, it looks like for the 11 ball. Oh, he blasts that one in. It looks like he accidentally moves the 12 ball. So typically you should uh, end up waiting uh, for the cue ball to stop moving before you do that. Because if the cue ball does come around and hit that 12 ball after it's been moved, I do believe that's considered a foul uh, because it affects the entire uh, results of the, ta uh, of the table. Uh, but since it wasn't anywhere near, he moves it back and then uh, checks uh, with me if I'm okay with where he moved it was. And I was fine with it. No big deal. But then it looks like he overcuts his 14 ball. And now I'm back at the table. And now... I don't have to worry about the eight ball. The eight ball has a free path uh, to go into the uh, the top left corner pocket. So if anybody is in this position here, what would y'all do? What kind of pattern would y'all attempt to run here? Um, I can obviously shoot the two ball into the bottom left corner pocket. I can shoot the four ball into the um, upper right corner pocket. Can't really do anything with the five ball as far as saying it towards a pocket, but I can obviously try to combo uh, the five into the two ball and hopefully have the five ball also park uh, park itself near uh, the bottom left uh, corner pocket. Uh, so I'm going to take a couple of suggestions uh, out of the live chat. Let's see it, everybody. Uh, what ball or what pattern would y'all try to do here? Because it would be at least fairly obvious that the eight ball probably should go into the top left corner pocket regardless of what my pa of what the pattern is going to be i would think but what do y'all have out there i see george harrell uh wants to do the four ball first okay uh so what are we thinking about george if we shoot the four ball and most of the time i'm going to be using just like natural rolling of the cue ball right if we just shoot this then we have to dodge the 12 Right, so we can at least try to hit the rail here. We don't want to try to draw this ball here because we, uh, in order to um, extend it away from it, because we don't really want to try risk uh, shooting or risk scratching. Right, so we at least need to dodge this ball. So when it hits this rail, it's going to come back out. So we obviously don't want to get hooked uh, behind any of these. And if anything, if we can avoid all of that, we might be able to do a five-two combination or maybe just play the two ball or whatever. I would have to think that those would be some possible options. 100% um, bow hunter also says four ball first, but I have Eric G that says two five four, and then the uh, then most likely the eight ball. So if you're gonna shoot the two ball first, that would have to mean whoops, provided that I can draw a straight line, that would mean that you'd have to cut it in, and the cue ball would have to do something like this. So probably a little bit of uh, maybe some center left uh, in order to do something like that. So that way you can have your shot on the five ball. And then where do we want the cue ball to be uh, to be able to shoot the four ball in and get position uh, for the uh, for the eight? I would have to think something like this would be good because then we can just cut this into the corner pocket like this and just bring the cue ball out like this, possibly with some bottom right spin. Like, I think that's a pretty good option. Uh, let's see, we got Ron, the pool student, also says uh, two, five, four. We've got... Um, Raheem Carter, 5248. So I'm assuming when you say 5248, you are referring to a 52 combination um, after that, uh, because there's really no place for me to play the play the five ball. Uh, so it'd be five combo two, and then possibly five again, and then four eight. These are all uh, really good decisions. I don't really see an issue. My my only concern is starting with the four ball. Like I said, because we, we have to be able to dodge uh, hitting the 12 ball because if we get hooked anywhere uh, up here, things get a little difficult. So I would think percentage wise, starting with the 5-2 combination or starting with the two ball would probably be the best choice uh, to do um, in this particular uh, situation. So let's see what I did. <clears throat> You can see, like I said, I have some obvious choices here, but 
every time I come to the table, I'm always looking around. I'm always planning. All right, so it looks like I'm going to play the 5-2 combination. That looks like a center ball hit. Do I have any spin on it? Let's see what the cue ball does off the rail. That looks like maybe no spin or just a touch of right spin. And then what am I doing now? Now I'm going up for the, the four ball. So it looks like I want to try to use the five ball to get position uh, on the eight. So you can see it looks like I have some low left. This is kind of what I was talking about that you don't really want to do with the opening shot because you want to be able to avoid scratching. But look what happens, right? This is why you didn't really want to start with the four ball. But I honestly thought that I could obviously get out into the open. But does anybody know what I'm doing? When, they, when, when you see me uh, lay my cue across the table uh, like this, does anybody know what I'm doing here? Is anybody familiar with the plus two rail kicking system? Because that's what I'm going to end up doing, or at least that's what I measured up. So here I have some right spin, a little bit of top right spin, and watch what happens. You get a little lucky at the same time. Knock the five in and get a little bit of position on the eight. You see me kind of throw my hands up uh, like that because the uh, the 13 ball getting in the way of the uh, the eight ball to go here into the bottom left corner pocket. But you see me that I'm calling it here um, into the side pocket. And there you see I'm checking to see if the tangent line is at least going to allow me to avoid scratching um, in the side pocket. So let's see if I make this eight ball first and then I'm going to go back and kind of show you the, uh, the, the, plus, uh, the plus two rail uh, kicking system. I think here it's just a kind of a little bit of an above center hit with a rolling cue ball as I try to cut the eight ball into the side pocket. I avoid the scratch and I make the eight ball. So I am on the board. I do believe actually that is one inning because my opponent did shoot. So here's all of the uh, the troubleshooting uh, that I have to deal with. But let's go back and look at the plus two kicking system. So you end up seeing somewhere right around here. What am I doing here? Well. I'm going to go ahead and try to illustrate out the plus two rail kicking system. And then eventually I'll actually create a legit um, pool lesson um, out of this. But the way the plus two system works is that when you're going from side rail uh, to corner pocket, in this case, I'm on what would be from the view angle, the left side of the table, and I'm kicking down to the bottom left corner pocket. So what you end up doing is you start here at the corner pocket and you label the corner pocket one because if this were a three cushion billiard table we can actually shoot straight into uh, that corner but since it's a pocket billiard table we can't do that so therefore you still start by labeling it one then you go over half a diamond and you label that two then you go over half a diamond you label that three half a diamond four half a diamond five etc 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 And you can even come over here and say eight if you want to, if we want to just keep if we want to just keep following. I'll even put a nine here, even though it's not even usable. Now, what do these numbers even represent? All right. That's got to that's got to be everybody's first question. Well, what these numbers represent based on where your cue ball is at and the line that it's going to travel. If you were to kick at any one of these numbers with running spin, uh, in this case, running English, in this case, I'm kicking to my right. So therefore, I'm putting right spin. But you use, use a little bit of top right spin, then what this system says is that the cue ball should go two rails around and then come down that many diamonds. So if we look and see the line that I have here with my cue, starting with the side pocket, because the side pocket is one, two, three, four diamonds away from the corner pocket, that you see that I have a line here that kind of goes like this, that if I were to kick at diamond four with top right spin, then my cue ball should come down four diamonds. But if I remember correctly, the cue ball is not exactly on that line. So you kind of do the same type of uh, either parallel shifting or half parallel shifting, uh, depending upon whatever the closest line is that you're looking for. Because I do believe you see my cue move when I do this. Right, so I set the cue down and I, I do believe I slide my cue over right there. So I think the actual four line from side pocket to um, mark four was past the cue ball. So then I kind of just slid over to where I can see where the cue ball needs to hit on the rail. 
and then try to do the kick. And then if y'all saw my last uh, banking video where I talked about where you do have to uh, take into account how hard you hit the uh, the cue ball into the rail. And of course, do you put the, the correct amount of spin? Because if you don't, things could go uh, completely different. And we saw that I didn't exactly come straight into the ball. I actually got a little lucky and uh, hit a little short and that's what allowed me to get the position or one allowed me to make the ball and get position on the ball because if I would have came flat into the ball I probably would have scratched or if I would have came and hit um, a little um, actually this would be long this would be short if I hit the uh, short rail that's actually sending my cue ball long and if I hit the uh, the side rail here that actually sends my cue ball a little short so if I actually were to hit this shot short then I would hit the rail and my cue ball would probably just drift out here. I might have a shot. It'd be just a long shot off of the rail in order to go here. So I hope all of that makes sense. If nobody um, in the room is familiar with the plus two uh, kicking system, this is a very, very, very reliable system when you want to kick from side rail to corner pocket. So if I was on this side rail here trying to kick to this corner pocket, then I would start here by labeling it one two, three, four, and so on and so forth. And just look for where I want the cue ball to end up going. So if the object ball that I wanted to hit was right here, well, I only want to come three diamonds down instead of four. So I would end up trying to do some sort of alignment that would look like this and then do whatever type of parallel shifting I need to do in order to try to kick the cue ball two rails and, and have it come down three diamonds, hopefully for some type of hit maybe even a make now of course when the object ball is not directly on the track lines there's just a little bit of adjusting uh, that you have to be able to try to um, account for so it's not always going to be 100 percent accurate but at least gets you in a pretty good ballpark to where you're gonna score a hit and in my case here i made the ball and i had rough position on the eight ball afterwards, but I was at least able to steal the rack. So let's at least look at the uh, the kick shot one more time. And what I probably could have done uh, differently, because um, I honestly don't think uh, I was actually trying to hit the uh, the bottom rail. I actually wanted to just be able to make the ball. Um, I probably could have hit it maybe a little bit softer and that would have widened the angle back out to where um, my end result probably would have been a short uh, kick to where I would have hit the side rail, come back out and then have some sort of shot on the eight ball. So I hope that makes sense. We already know what the result is, so I'm just going to fast forward um, onto the, uh, the next rack. So here we go. Classic break number two, a little bit of top spin. Let's see if I can get that cue ball to stop right near the middle of the table. Kind of like that, but then the cue ball gets kicked around. Uh, did I make a ball? I see a stripe went in. Oh, did y'all see that? Let's look at that again. I get the cue ball to stop right in the middle of the table, but it gets kicked around by a couple of balls. What? Look right here. Look right here. Here's the eight ball. Eight on the break. Eight on the break. Let's look at that one more time. What in the world happened? Uh, look, watch the three ball here on the corner. What's the corner ball supposed to do um, in a uh, eight ball rack or even a 10 ball rack? Watch it go four rails around. And if that eight ball wasn't there, it doesn't even look like the three ball would have went. But like I said, the, the corner ball, like an eight ball rack and a 10 ball rack um, have predictable target balls that you can actually make or they at least have um the the, the predictable the, the predictable target balls have predictable paths that they'll go provided of course that the rack is racked as good as it possibly can be minus a couple of gaps here and there because we are using some uh we are using a regular rack and we're not using a template rack so the fact that i made the eight ball on the break there complete luck uh not like when you're trying to hit the second uh the ball that's in the second row uh in order to be able to get the um uh, the eight ball to go into one of the uh, the side pockets. So let's try this break on for size and see what happens. Oh, a cue ball just kind of just nudges its way back and just falls right into the side pocket. 
Oh my goodness. I did make a ball on the break though. I just wish the uh the cue ball would have stayed on the table. So let's see what my opponent does. And when you scratch um on the break um in APA eight ball, you have to start with the cue ball behind the head string. You can only shoot at balls that are past uh the head string. So let's see what his uh opening is gonna be. Looks like he wants to maybe start with the uh one ball to go into the top right corner pocket. I see. I like what he's doing. He's doing the same thing. Like he's he's checking the entire table out first before he does anything. I mean, he's got cue ball in hand, right? So he can he can just take an obvious shot and then try to go and then just try to go from there. Oh, wait a minute. Is he trying to take out the five ball? That's actually a really good choice. I I kind I kind of like that since since he since he wants solids. I kind of like starting uh, with the uh, the five ball. But now, what about that six ball? Let's see, it looks like we're going to try the two. Uh, that looked like it was uh, some stunned left spin to bring the cue ball back uh, to where it's at. Three ball is going to go into the bottom right corner pocket. Maybe had a twist of right spin there. So where's the one ball going? Is that going into the top left? Oh, this actually would have been good. He wants he wants to get flat on that four ball because then he could just kind of just gently roll it into the top right corner pocket, have the cue ball follow forward a little bit, and shoot the six ball into the bottom right. But since he's uh, he's got this angle, playing it the way that he did was actually really smart. Ton of right spin um, on the cue ball to try to get the uh, four ball to go into the uh, top right corner pocket and then try to spin its way into the six. But it looks like he um, either didn't cut it enough or the um, or or overcut it. Oh, wow, I ended up flirting with that um, side pocket there. That looked like that had to have been some amount of uh, top left spin. Uh, we can see, though, that I am lined up for the uh, 15 ball here. Probably just some top spin here as I just push the cue ball forward, maybe get position on the 11. I would have to think that my 13 ball is going to be the last ball uh, that I shoot. Looks like I got some draw on that one. Pull the cue ball back for the, what is that, the, the 12, I think it is. Yeah, so if I just roll this ball in, probably with a, a hint of a right spin, just so I can get a little bit more distance away from the uh, from the nine ball, you can see I have another angle where the cue ball will drive into the bottom rail and then come back up for position on the 13. The question is, where am I shooting the 13? That looks like bottom right. It is. Now, did y'all see that little gesture that I did there? Let me roll it back just a, just a second. That right there. Did y'all see that? Why do you think I'm doing that? Because I know a lot, I, I've seen it uh, before where um, you might look at a person uh, when they're playing and you see them complaining about something and you look at the table and go, what's he complaining about? Like, I have a shot at the 13 ball. What in the world could I possibly uh, be complaining about? Why would I make this uh, uh, this kind of gesture? Anybody have any idea? <clears throat> it's clear that the 13 ball is going to be going here. But where's the cue ball going? All right? Naturally wants to go over here. If I, if I don't do anything, right? So this is called being on the wrong side of the shot line. This is the path that the 13 ball is going to take and look where my cue ball's at. So when I come all the way back to here, all right, let's back up to this shot again. I really want my cue ball to be somewhere right around here. So that way, if I can land somewhere right around here on this side of the shot line, with my bottom right spin that I did, like this, I really wanted to come up like this. So that way when I shoot the 13 in, my cue ball can just drift over here and then I have a straight shot at the eight ball, all right? That is at least what my plan was, but the plan goes a little wrong when I end up on the wrong side. So now I have to put in work. So this is going to be with some bottom left spin as I try to get the cue ball, do this, and then come back out over here. 
shoot the eight into the corner pocket. Certainly doable, but what does it matter if I miss? <laughs> I just end up dogging the ball. Uh, I got the position I wanted, but I just missed. So, my opponent gets another chance at this rack here. Let's see what he does. I didn't really leave him much. All right, he might be able to cut the six ball um, into the uh, top left corner pocket, but that means his cue ball is going to run into the four. Maybe scratch? You see he's got a boatload of topspin. Oh, he's trying to play safe. Oh, no. We know that's not what he wanted. You can even see right where he places uh, his cue stick. This is where he wanted his uh, cue ball to end up. Looks like he was trying to hook me behind the eight ball by playing a defensive shot. But I've got ball in hand, one ball left on the table, eight balls wide out into the open. A little bit of a stop shot on the uh, the 13 ball, fairly straight on the eight ball to go into the top left corner pocket. And another draw shot, or a stop shot, um, if you will. So I believe that puts me up three to zero, and I think we're only on three innings. I'm not sure. Here we go. Classic break number four. And you see there, when you when you watch my cue ball, my cue ball goes off to the right after the break. That means I'm not hitting the head ball as straight as I would want to be. I'm a little bit off to the right of center between the cue ball and the head ball. And that's not really what I'm going for. I at least made a ball. I'm I'm still at the table, right? So that, that those are all good things, but I'm very particular about my breaks. I mean, y'all know how I do like nine ball breaks and stuff. So like these are things that I always look for to see like how good uh, my breaks could possibly be, especially when I'm trying to squat the cue ball near the uh, the center of the table. So I must have made um, a solid and a stripe and we start with the nine ball that looked like a little bit of top inside or top right spin to bring the cue ball uh, towards the middle of the table. So I must be wanting to shoot the 14 ball next, but I'm checking to make sure that I'm going to have some sort of shot at looks like either of these two balls here. What is that? That looks like some bottom spin, maybe a touch of right spin. No, just bottom spin. And I end up overdrawing the ball. Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure I wanted to be able to maybe cut uh, this 13 ball here, and that way I can probably um, open up the um, the 14 ball here. Now what am I doing? Am I going to cut the 12 into the side? Let's see, what in the world am I doing? If I cut the 12 into the side, my cue ball runs into uh, this 13 ball, uh, possibly pushes forward, maybe bumps into the 11. I'm not sure if the 13 will break this stuff out. What am I doing? So, what did I do besides, <laughs> besides create a mess? <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, let's go back and look at that again, because I got I to gotta watch the reaction of the cue ball. Did I just did I just slightly draw the ball? Yeah, I think so. I think it's just a little bit of below center. But oh gosh, what a mess. What a mess. All right. So y'all see what I'm doing here? It looks like I'm going to try to cut the 11 ball into the 3 and see if it'll carom uh into the corner pocket. But if I'm going for the out here, that means I have to have some left spin um, on this cue ball so I can try to break those other stripes out. Yeah, see, I try to break the stripe out, end up accidentally pocketing my opponent's two ball, break everything open, but also break everything open for, for my opponent. So not a very smart decision uh, by me. But you can see here again, my opponent wastes no time. Plays the combination, gets a nice little friendly bump on the one ball. Six ball looks like it can go into the side pocket. I probably wouldn't try to play position uh, for it. Or he's going to try to take it right now. Oh, and he overcuts the ball. All 
All right, so doesn't look like I have very many options, except for maybe trying to play the 11 ball here into the side pocket. If I try to cut it down into the corner, I'll most likely scratch. You can see I'm bridging over the eight ball. So I have to have a little bit of top spin. I'm not putting any side spin because I don't want to masse the, uh, the cue ball. Oh, and I end up undercutting the 11 ball. So my opponent gets to come back to the table, starting with the six ball. A little bit of a stop shot there. Four should go into the corner, it looks like. We fired that one in with some right spin. Let's see here. I probably would have just done that with some left spin instead, so that way you can have a positional shot maybe on the three ball. It looks like he can see the three ball. That's interesting. What's with the what's with the chalk on the table? I'm usually pretty familiar with the rules. Um is that allowed? I mean he's not he's it seems like he's using the chalk as a as, as a as a as a measuring device, but he ends up fouling and, hit, and hitting the eight ball first. Is that allowed? Like, would would that be a foul, or maybe not a foul, maybe a sport uh, uh sportsmanship uh, type of thing that um he should receive a warning, I guess, because obviously he moves the chalk before he shoots. Because if he would have left it there and shot, I think that would have been a foul, because you have, basically have some form of interference um on the table. All right, so I have ball in hand. I end up taking the uh, third. Actually, let's do this again. Let's do this again. You already said. Spoiler alert! I start with the uh, I start with the thirteen ball. But uh, let's wait for everything to come to a stop right here. What's everybody's pattern um, here? Cue ball in hand. Probably not really. Um, probably not really a wrong decision. Like there's there's probably really no pattern uh, that would mess this up um because of where the eight ball's at right it, it's just what pattern requires the least amount of movement i guess is maybe what um i could be asking for uh, because i think any one of these three stripes could be done last and the eight ball would still uh be going uh to the um, upper left corner pocket uh black market reviews you think he's using the chalk to aim like a like a ghost ball method i can see that i can see that uh uh is it chire lost or cheer lost you're asking what uh pool size uh the the table is these are seven foot tables because this is a um apa league where it shouldn't matter that it's an apa league but um this this league is played on uh seven foot tables <clears throat> but what does everybody think eric g says uh 9 11 10 that's actually the 13 ball uh, but so, you know, you would say that th the, the 13 ball first, 11 in the side, and then the 10 most likely, um, into the bottom left corner pocket. That would, that would be my guess, right? So if we shot the 13 in and we got some sort of, either we draw it back, or I think we already saw that I used the side rail and then came back so I can shoot the 11 into the, uh, side pocket, play a stop shot on the 10 down here, and then just have the cue ball right here for the eight ball. I, I, th I think that's what I ended up doing here. Uh, we've got 11, 13, and then 10. I don't see an issue with that. I don't see an issue with that at, uh, at all. Um, let's see, because we do this. Stop shot, 13, draw back a little bit. It's just basically a bunch of bottom spin shots. I would have to think either, either, either stop shots or just like slight little, slight little draw shots, um, uh, in order to do that. So the only thing that you can really mess up is just, not drawing back far enough, um, I guess, um, especially um, in this case here, like if you did a stop shot um, on the 11 ball here, you'd end up with a back cut angle on the 13 ball. So that means your cue ball would drag out like this um, if you weren't careful. Like that's really the only risk uh, that you're kind of running when you, um, if you're just going to do, um, I, I think if you're doing that particular order with a bunch of uh, slight draw shots or maybe some stop shots. Let's see how this works again. Let's see what I do. I know we already know that I started with the 13 ball.
All right, see, but I give myself an angle so my cue ball goes into the rail. I want my cue ball to go into the rail. And I have a little bit of bottom right spin. Now, that probably didn't come back as much as I wanted it to, uh, but it looks like I can just float that 11 ball in with a rolling cue ball and then play the 10 in the opposite side. Now, question is, do I have too steep of an angle to where I can't hold the cue ball? Or do I have to allow the cue ball to move? And there you see, I'm looking, because I, if, if, if the angle's too steep, I'm looking to see, does the eight ball go into the side pocket? And if it does, then I'm fine with just letting the cue ball roll. Oh. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, did I almost royally screw that up? So I must, I, I had to have accidentally had maybe just a little bit of bottom spin uh, on that shot for, in order, in order for that to happen. But we do have the eight ball to go into the side pocket. This is going to be with some top spin, obviously, since I'm close, so close to the rail and the corner pocket. And I get it. So that puts me on the hill. And I, I think we're on five innings now. And some. <laughs> Has anybody been keeping track of the innings? <laughs> this is like your typical APA night, right? Where we don't know how many innings, <laughs> how many innings we're on. <laughs> I honestly do not remember. <clears throat> but as I'm on the hill, you see where my cue ball's at. Time for time for me to really try to do um, an eight ball break here. So I'm gonna have a boatload of bottom spin. I think at this point in time, I am still using just a touch of inside spin because I try to get the cue ball to go to the side rail and come back into the rack. So I basically wanna hit the rack twice. Kinda like that. And we see the eight ball just comes right down. Like I said, you're, you're almost guaranteed that the eight ball will move out of the rack when you hit the ball that's in the second row. And that's why I always say that it increases your chances of making the eight ball on the break. It's still a low chance, but it's a higher chance than just doing a head-on hit. Now, opponent immediately gets started with stripes. Like he's going to play the nine ball into the uh, top left corner pocket. Ties up his 13 ball. Well, the 13 ball might go to the uh, upper right corner pocket. I'm not entirely sure, but it doesn't look like he has anything from here. Got a super thin cut shot on the 14 ball to go into the side pocket. Is that what he's trying? I'd watch the cue ball. Ooh, that was a good try. Avoided the scratch. Just uh, ended up, what was that? That was an undercut, um, I think it was. So let's try to remember the inning count. I don't know if we're on six or not. We might be on seven. Not entirely sure. Let's see. I've got my work cut out for me. I've got the seven ball tied up next to the 15. I've got the two ball tied up with the 12. What am I doing? Am I shooting the four into the bottom left? That'll free up the seven. And that's what I'm trying. Oh, and I don't end up cutting it enough. I would have had a shot at the uh, the seven ball had, had I'd made it. All right, so let's see what we got here. 13 ball going to the bottom left, maybe? Ooh. What was my opponent trying to do there? Let's look at that again. I really want to know maybe what he was trying to do. Let's, let's watch the cue ball. What was he trying to do there? He stuns the cue ball over to the side rail. He's got a boatload of spin. I couldn't tell. No, he, he wouldn't be. I was thinking, like, is he trying to push my six into his ball to be, be able to get the stuff um, off of the rail? I, I, I would think not. He must have been just trying to get over here for position on the uh, 11 or, or the 13. But I'm, I'm just not I'm not entirely sure um, on that one. All right, so seven ball into the uh, top left corner pocket. Pretty sure I did not want to run into that 11 ball, so that way I don't have to do this back cut on the uh, the four ball to go into the top right. What do I got here? A okay, little bit of left spin, I just, or a little bit of a rolling left spin shot there. I still got to figure out what I'm going to do here. I think this is my issue. 
So if I'm shooting this three ball, I'm more than likely going to try to deal with this issue right now. I'm willing to bet I've got some left spin um, on this cue ball. It looks like I've got a little bit of bottom spin as well. I, I have to be trying to break out that uh, those two solids over there. Yep, and I tried. You can see it's like, I missed. I tried to do it, but I messed up. So now what? I mean, I could maybe try to do a 2-6 combination um, if, if I get the, the right position. Because right now, I don't think I can shoot the 6 into the corner. I, at least the camera angle doesn't uh, allow me to see it. Oh, I'm looking to see if I can land right around here. Because then that maybe will, will allow me to make the 6 ball into the corner pocket. And I could possibly break out my 2. So if I'm elevated like that, I'm going to be putting bottom spin on the cue ball. Yeah, I, I, I have to be trying to draw the cue ball off of the five over to the side rail to see if I get position on the six. And then what, do I change my mind? What am I doing? Oh, I popped the heck out of that cue ball. I must be going for the 2-6 combination. Yeah. 2-6 combination. The two ball should go a little bit off to the right. I might be able to play it into the top right corner pocket if I make this combo. Kind of like that. And with the 8 ball being down here, I, I have to be using the 1 ball as my last ball. Like, there's no sense in me playing the 1 ball now and then trying to play the 2 ball and get back up here. So I think the... This looks like maybe a little bit of top inside spin here right there because the inside spin or the right spin kills the angle as the cue ball comes down. Otherwise, I would have ended up somewhere near those stripes. Fairly straight shot on the uh, the one ball, probably just a little bit of a stop shot there and then a straight shot in on the eight ball for the win. And there you have it. End up pulling that one off five to zero. I think in seven innings, maybe eight. Not not entirely sure, but that would be your typical um, APA uh, league night there when you're just not entirely sure uh, how many innings uh, you would have gone through there. But I think the I think the biggest thing that that comes out of this match here is my usage of the plus two rail uh, kicking system. I do remember uh, after seeing this match that that's what I was going to call uh this uh match here for the video that i would make basically labeling it the uh the plus two rail system uh the plus two rail kicking system works so now let's go back to here because let's just take a small break let's go back through the chat and see if we can answer a couple of questions here and there what y'all think of that match? Let's see here. I liked the interaction. I like seeing uh, some of the ideas of what um, other people uh, thought. Like when I asked you, like what what kind of pattern uh, would you have played in in some of the uh, the particular areas um, and whatnot? It's like I usually like to I usually try to say that there 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 almost is no wrong pattern. It's just that other patterns are easier than others and other patterns are harder than others so clearly you would want to try to choose the easiest pattern that you can be most successful on i think even on that last one i was kind of just a little off um, because i would have to think that i wanted to shoot that eight ball into the top left corner pocket and not uh, flirt with scratching in the uh, the top right corner pocket like i like i almost did uh and ended up having to play a backup shot by playing the uh the eight ball into the uh the side pocket but you know, uh, can't be a perfect player. Make mistakes uh, here and there. Hey, we got my uh, fellow Texan, uh, Bryant from Corner 4 Billiards. He wants to know if I have a Masters League. We did. We just don't need more. Uh, because we just we just don't have the players uh, that are interested um, in playing that. I think I, I think I tried playing in Masters League, I think maybe two, two or three sessions. Uh, but then um, after the last session, just there weren't enough players that came back to do it. So they just stopped doing it. Uh, let's see. Raheem Carter, you want to know if I have any tips for tournament play? And it, my answer to that is 
most likely going to not be any different uh, than the answer that I gave to Chris um, earlier in the stream when he was wanting to know what kind of advice that I would give him for um, playing in the APA league for the first time, basically playing in competition um, for the first time. And, you know, that it's, it's simply put to where whenever you're playing in competition, you just want to be able to play your best. Don't really try to go for any type of Hail Mary shots uh, to where the – Unless it's absolutely necessary, I won't say never. Like, don't ever uh, go for uh, help, uh, uh, or don't always try to play so conservatively. Every now and again, you gotta go for a hail mary shot, but more times than not, you shouldn't, uh, because you really don't want to say to yourself that you just gave games away because you didn't make like the best of decisions, right? If you're making good decisions on top of having good execution, uh, but you end up losing. Like I said, I, I just think that that's a loss that you should be okay with. Um, and you just, you just have to learn, like, where did things go wrong? Because clearly if you try to make good decisions, you can still mess up, right? You can, you can, me you can mess up um, on uh, easy shots. You can mess up on trying to play some sort of defensive shot, right? But it's, it's better than trying to go for some sort of Hail Mary shot. You missed the shot, and you ended up just selling the table out to your opponent, right? That Those those are the biggest things that you always want to avoid when you're playing in competition is, is just selling the racks out. But when you're, when, you're, when you're at least making good decisions but just not executing uh, well enough, then, I mean, to me, that's just kind of normal. It's frustrating. Frustrating as heck uh, when stuff like that happens, but it is normal. And it, it, it should be – you should be – you should be able to better take that loss than taking the other type of loss where you're just like, you know, you went for a shot that you shouldn't have and then you lost the rack, if, if that makes any sense. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, painting uh, with a... Felon, uh, felon, felon, uh, APA championship. When a coach, uh, on my opponent's team left the chalk on the wood of the rail, uh, where he wanted her to hit, I'm assuming this is like a timeout session you're describing. Um, you were told by the ref, as long as it's not in the felt, the shooting is legal. Um, as far as I know, that is absolutely true. Um, as, cause you cannot mark the felt of the table or even the 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 rail felt uh but you know chalk is always going to be on the table right it's going to always be somewhere on the rail so they don't really try they're they're not really uh nitpicky um about that in regards to that if you just happen to place the chalk down where you want to kick into the rail then that's okay because it, it's what in my opinion it's just one of those fine lines to where it's fairly obvious when you literally just put it down because that's where you want to kick, especially when you see it in a, in a timeout session. But, you know, when you're just – if you just passively walk around the table, chalk your cue, and then pl and place your chalk down, it's usually hard to – it can be difficult to tell whether or not if it's intentional or not. So they, they I, I think they just outright just – Forget about, you know, trying to determine is it intentional or is it not intentional. Just say as long as whatever you're placing on the table, the chalk um, is not touching the felt um, of the rail, then it's perfectly fine to use that as some sort of marker to know that you're either going to bank the ball into the rail at the point of the chalk or you're going to kick the cue ball into the rail at the point of the chalk. Um, that That is a thing. Let's see what else. Hey, Nate Tan, you see, I think... Optimal pattern depends on the player. Some players are more comfortable drawing versus rolling versus stunning. Uh, pick the pattern that matches your strengths, I think. I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with that, but I think we can say for certain that drawing a ball is harder to control than a rolling ball, than, than, than a rolling cue ball. Even, stun, even stunning, right? Because it, it's, it's very, e or it's easier that if you just hit the cue ball and the cue ball rolls, right? The only thing you have to be wary of is just how how far do you want it to roll. So you're you're really just dealing with power uh, more more than anything else, All right? So what I have learned over the course of time is trying to make sure that you get your cue ball in positions to where you're usually going for like uh, close to half ball hits. Because that allows you to use the rolling uh, a rolling cue ball more often, 
does it always happen? No. I mean, like you saw in my last match, I wasn't always using a rolling cue ball. There was a lot of times where I was drawing the ball using topspin or whatever. Uh, but on some of the shots where I just did use a rolling cue ball, maybe a twist of side spin or whatever, then the cue ball kind of just floated around uh, where, wherever wherever I needed it to be. <clears throat> Uh, Persistent Wolf Billiards, you're saying you wanted to thank me publicly again for helping you with your break. You're more than welcome. Uh, you got to play Allison. I'm assuming that's Allison Fisher. Is she doing uh, some sort of exhibition uh, in your area? And you managed to hit the rack rate, squat the cue ball near the center of the table. That's freaking awesome. Well, what happened after that? I'm just playing. <laughs> it's like you, you got an awesome break, but what happened after that? I'm just I'm just kidding. But that's awesome. It's like, so I'm... Hopefully you're able to do that on a consistent basis. You saw even on my breaks, I was a little to the left, a little to the right. Uh, but then I had that one break where the cue ball squatted right in the middle of the table, but it got kicked around. But then I also made the eight ball on the break um, on that one there. <clears throat> but you do want to try to have that consistent break, get that nice spread, squat the cue ball near the center of the table. More times than not, you will have some sort of an opening shot and you might be able to have full control of the table. Um, Adrian Villa Lobos, I hope I said that correctly. Any advice on how to practice on drawing back the cue ball? Well, I mean, just there's there's just the simple idea of you know just just uh, setting up your setting up your draw shots and and drawing them back. But you know it's there there's a video that I have um on my uh, YouTube channel. It's a three in one straight in drill. Um, and that's where you can practice your stop shots, your follow shots, uh, and your draw shots. And I basically have, uh, from corner pocket to corner pocket, um, a set of reinforcement labels. I think I spaced, the, if I remember correctly, I spaced them one diamond uh, lengths apart. Um, I measured the length of, uh, of, uh, of my diamonds with the measuring tape and then uh, had a laser, I set a laser down at the corner pocket and just lasered it all the way to the other corner pocket and then placed the, the reinforcement labels uh, down. And the objective of the drill um, is to pocket the ball and depending upon what you're working on. So for example, if you're just trying to do stop shots, then you obviously want the cue ball to just stop right on contact. And what that's supposed to help you, uh, um, with is how straight are you actually aiming? Because you can make the ball, but if your cue ball wiggles off to the left or the right, then you didn't hit the, the ball straight. So therefore you're kind of cheating the pocket. And so when you're drawing the cue ball, since your question was about draw shots, well, what do you do? Well, it depends on the distance that you have between the cue ball and the object ball. So if you're, say, two diamond lengths away, three diamond lengths away, wh whatever you want to start with, like your first objective should be to try to just get the cue ball to stop, right? So you know, like, how low do you want to hit on the cue ball and how hard or how fast do you want to hit the cue ball? So that way, when the backspin gets there, it kind of dies out and the cue ball slides into the object ball and halts right on contact. Because then you would start practicing how fast do you have to hit the cue ball, how far below do you have to hit the cue ball, so that way the cue ball draws back about a foot or draws back about two feet, three feet, four feet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so that, that's pretty much like how you practice drawing, uh, drawing the cue ball is to see, like, can you control how far back you want the cue ball to draw uh, depending upon the distance that you start the cue ball and the object ball with. So if the cue ball and the object ball are only one diamond length away, it should be fairly easy to be able to draw the ball because the cue ball doesn't have a whole lot of distance to travel forward before it makes contact with the object ball and then try to draw its way back. But if there is distance between the cue ball and the object ball, that gets a little bit more difficult because you are having to hit the cue ball faster um, slash harder. You know, everybody can debate me on what word is appropriate when you're hitting the cue ball. Are you hitting the cue ball with more power or are you hitting it with faster, uh, hitting the cue ball faster? If anybody saw my last video on uh, how to, um, uh, how to, the, the best advice I, I can give on drawing the cue ball. And I always like to use the word fast. But anytime that you're doing um, something fast slash harder, it's easier to lose control. Uh, simply put, if you try to do the stroke test where you shoot the cue ball um, down the uh, length of the table, hit the short round, come back and hit your tip, the harder you hit that cue ball, there's going to be a point to where you just can't control it, right? You'll you'll hit the cue ball, the cue ball will go down and hit the rail and then probably just spin off to one side. Or, like it's not going to come straight back um, and, and hit the tip of your cue because you're going to lose some type of accuracy. You're not going to hit the cue ball directly in the center. And the same applies that when you're doing um, draw shots, that the, the harder slash faster 
to you hit your draw shots, the less accurate you're probably going to be on your aim. And you're not going to be able to draw the cue ball straight back. It'll probably draw off at some sort of angle. But I mean, hopefully you, you get the idea of like what, how you can use that information to be able to practice uh, your draw shots. Because practicing follow would be the exact same thing. Like, how do you hit the cue ball in such a way to where after you hit the object ball, the, uh, the cue ball kind of just follows forward kind of like a foot or half a foot, two feet, three feet, you know, whatever. Uh, but nothing sums up practicing it, right? But but give yourself conditions on what you're trying to practice on. Don't just say, I want to draw the ball, right? Because you hit the ball and on, on one practice shot, you drew it back four feet. But on the next practice shot, you drew it back two feet. On the next practice shot, you drew it back six feet and then five. And you're just all over the place and you're not consistently producing the same exact results, right? Know what the, res know what the end result is of the shot that you want to do. And then that's what you want to practice on over and over and over and over because that would be your basically drilling uh the shot that you're trying to do so i hope that makes sense let's see here yeah, i see a bunch of draw for shows follow <laughs> i thought uh draw for shows follow for dough <laughs> very common phrase uh that we uh that we like to use that you know more times than not, you should try to avoid drawing the cue ball because it, it, it just is harder to control, right? Because a ball, when, when hit, just naturally wants to go forward. So the, the more times that you just do what the cue ball or you allow the cue ball to do what it naturally wants to do, the easier it is uh, to be able to control it. <clears throat> uh, let's see, flow tester 21, when you break, are you aiming at the center of the cue ball? It depends. Um, if I'm doing the um, classic break, like I was doing an eight ball, I'm hitting just slightly above center um, on the cue ball. And I am trying to hit the um, uh, the head ball fairly straight on. Sometimes it might be just like a slight angle um, because what ends up happening, especially like on an eight ball rack or a 10 ball rack, when you hit that head ball straight or as straight as you can, the weight of the rack by itself pushes the cue ball back. So if you've ever had a, a break shot before where you just see your cue ball just kind of just zip its way back, that's obviously because you're hitting a little bit of a bottom spin um, on the cue ball. So when the weight of the rack pushes the cue ball back and it's spinning backwards at the same time, that's why your cue ball will just kind of just fly off the rack and, and then draw back towards the head rail. But when you put that top spin, a little bit of top spin um, on the cue ball, you should see times where the cue ball will get pushed back and then it fights its way back forward and kind of halts near the center of the table or it kind of dribbles forward. Or sometimes if you put too much top spin, you'll see it hesitate, come back and then just flow through the rack again. But in, in cases of eight ball and 10 ball, you're trying to get the cue ball to pop back from the weight of the rack and then dribble forward a little bit with a hint of top spin to try to land near the center of the table. <clears throat> Let's see here. Uh, I, I recommend one that feels best for you. What question? Where is that question? Oh, Cal Patty 15. Uh, what pull stick brand uh, would you recommend? And persistent uh, wolf billiards is correct. Uh, that's 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 always going to be my answer. It's the, the one that you want. Uh, the reason why I, I, I take that stance is because I, I never want to be in a position to where um, I tell you something's great and wonderful. And this applies to just everything in general, not just not just pull cues. But you ever you ever had a time where someone tells you some, something is great and wonderful and you listen to that advice and then you go and try it out for yourself and you end up not liking it? Well, what ends up happening? You don't blame yourself for making that decision. You blame the person that recommended that you do or take or – or buy whatever whatever the recommendation was. And I particularly just don't want to be in that position, right? But at least when it comes to pool equipment, um, you're, it's, it's personal preference. I mean, it's all just personal preference. If anybody follows me, y'all know that I shoot with predator cues. Uh, but I know plenty of people that just hate predator cues. They, they'd rather shoot with whatever it is they like to shoot with. Um, you know, and I can tell you how great and wonderful I like my predator cue. Some of y'all might agree. Some of y'all might disagree, and that that's that's perfectly fine. Um, but yeah, like you know, when it comes to equipment, I, I I don't have like a hard, fast, absolute uh, recommendation because everybody's different. Everybody likes different things. Let's see here. 
that pretty much wraps up a bunch of different questions. We can pretty much just maybe roll into the into the next match. I've got two more matches uh, left uh, that I can review. How long have I been streaming? I've already been streaming for over an hour. Uh, let's see. Uh, Steve Dodge, great format. Thanks. Uh, and to all my new coaches, 87 is super group. <laughs> awesome. I like it. I like it. And actually, yeah, so like Steve, I actually used to do these um, APA review matches um, post-production, meaning that I would be recording like all all these little clips um, and then splicing all the clips together of each of the wrecks. Like you wouldn't even you wouldn't even see the, the fast forwarding of the wrecks. So I would just uh, record a clip of the rack, do the commentary cue ball diagram like everything would happen post-production so that also means a lot of the reactions that i actually put into those are not really authentic right because if i if i do a post-production uh type of um recording when i'm doing the commentary if i screw up on my words uh in a sentence bad enough i'm gonna i'm gonna redo the entire clip everybody should hopefully have uh that was part of my last live stream uh, hopefully learned like how much of a perfectionist I try to be when I'm actually making my recorded YouTube content to where I want to make sure that every one of my words is heard clearly. I pronounce every syllable of a word um, at the appropriate time so that way my messages are clear and concise. Uh, but when I do recorded videos, they just take me hours to do. And I mean like anywhere from you know, I might get lucky and get something done in like three to four hours. And sometimes it can take eight to 10 plus hours to do, uh, especially if I'm just stumbling over my words over and over and over. But then I decided to, you know what, let me do these reviews on a live stream. So that way I can include the chat and the chat and, uh, and that way you get to see everything kind of raw on how I do it. And then of course, I'm going to stumble on my words. I'm going to throw in a filler every now and again, like um or or whatever. And of course, do all the drawings and everything else. But then, um, like I said, having the chat interact with everything so that when I clip the match out and have it be its own separate recorded uh, YouTube video, everybody gets to see that. Everybody gets to see how I try to include the chat. And it basically allows uh, the editing process to be so much quicker because I don't have to bother updating the scoreboard because I did that in real time. I did all the drawing in real time. I did the, the the manipulating of the cue ball diagram in real time. So all I'm really doing is clipping out the match and then I might record an intro, um, uh, a pre-recorded introduction and a, and a pre-recorded um, outro, splice those together and then post the video up and I'm done, all right? So it, it makes doing these things or these types of videos so much easier and I and I get them done so much quicker and I'm just, I'm more myself uh, because like, I have to try to remember on the fly uh, what happened. Sometimes I'll actually try to review the video pr uh, ahead of time so that way I can have some idea. But then other times I'll be like, what was I trying to do on the on this shot here? Was I trying to use left spin? I watched the cue ball, it ends up being right spin. Or it, the camera angle makes it look like I'm shooting at a ball and I, like, and I go, I think I'm shooting at this ball and I end up shooting at a completely different ball. Like So you get to see like little mess ups uh, like that here and there, which I happen to enjoy because I think it just makes the review just like all the more authentic, which I think just adds value uh, to the review. But that's 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 why I do this stuff. Let's see. Yeah, see, even my my, my buddy Corner for Billions is after making 35 videos because he has his own uh, YouTube channel. There's there's plenty of people that are in my live chat that have their own YouTube channels. Let me see if I can find them all and give them some, uh, some shout outs. Uh, so Corner for Billiards, uh, for example, he's a fellow Texan uh, of mine. We're eventually supposed to uh, meet up and do some sort of collab whenever we have time uh, because we're always so busy. But he, and he's, got, he's currently got 35 videos, and he still admits to this day how nervous he gets when he's trying to do that recorded material because, like, everybody should be able to appreciate that. Like, if you're going to put something out, uh, especially for us because we try to put together instructional material, you want your instructional material to be – listen to you want it to be heard you don't want people coming back at you and be like you know who the heck are you and like you have no idea what you're talking about or blah 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 or insult after insult like those are those are things that we as content creators are nervous about me not so much uh anymore like i've been do i've been doing this now for two years i've got over 100 videos and i'm gonna say what i say and mean what i say and that's that you can either like it or not like it and if you disagree with it fine you disagree with it but it doesn't change the way i feel about it or change my thought process um, about it. And when I finally started taking the stance of 
what I'm teaching is what works for me, and I hopefully teach it in such a way that you can understand it and try to replicate what I do. Uh, because if you look at any instructional material that's out there, you might run across um, some that you just you think you're following what they're saying, but you're not producing the same results. And there's only possibly two reasons why. Either you're not doing something right, or maybe they missed an explanation somewhere. There, there's, there's a gap somewhere in the explanation that's not allowing you to figure out, like, what are you doing wrong? All right, and I've spent more than enough time trying to make sure that when I explain something, I don't leave any of those gaps. Um, and everything is easily understood through my presentations and so far from what all of y'all tell me I've done a good job about that so so there you have it at least for for corner four billiards just you know goes through the same types of struggles that that I did um, persistent wolf billiards um, has a um, YouTube channel Nate Tam has a YouTube channel he's recently been publishing some stuff but he usually does um, he just usually talks to the camera about stuff that goes on uh, in the uh, in the pool industry um, he's got a couple of Got a couple of good videos uh, up there so far. You should actually go uh, go check them out and listen to the listen to the topic uh, at which he talks about. I think they're pretty good. I actually, you know, because he um, follows me on Facebook as well, and I hope to. I talked to him before about is like if we're gonna continuously see more stuff uh, out of him, uh, and he and, and I get the classic "we'll we'll see" uh, kind of answer. So I was like, all I can do is like keep pushing more and saying like, well, come on, let's 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 not do a "we'll see." Let's actually. Let's actually do it and produce uh, some content on a regular basis. Uh, let's see here. Um, if I scroll up, Ron the Pool Student, wonderful YouTube channel, uh, basically vlogs what he does in regards to um, how he tries to get better at the game uh, because he he basically started playing pool seriously this year. I think all the way back to February. Um, so. He kind of teaches um, in his videos, but he's teaching what he's trying to learn and shows and shows you in his videos his progress. So you'll see on certain videos where he doesn't do such a great job at maybe shooting or whatever, but then you could see the progression of practice taking excuse me, taking um, other people's advice and whatnot and being able to um, put them out onto the table and you get to see how much of a better player uh, that he's gotten. Or that he's become. Uh, let's see who else is in here. As I slowly scroll up, there's a couple of people I know that um, I had already passed by, like Eric Pool Guy Simpson 29. Uh, he likes to do a bunch of challenges um, on uh, his YouTube channel. Cue Ball Control sometimes I think does a bunch of uh, drill slash practice work um, on his YouTube channel. My buddy Ron Johnson, he actually has a YouTube channel called Rackham Jake. Um, we saw earlier um, Mr. Edit One, uh, or at least I saw him pop in. That intro that's at, that was at the very, very beginning of my live stream that basically just said, you know, the stream is starting soon because I allow people to just come into the stream um, was made by him because he's a professional video editor that also likes to play pool. So how cool is that? If you check out his channel, you actually see a bunch of uh, um, wrestling skits because he likes um, he likes to do um, backyard uh, wrestling on top of a bunch of uh, pool videos where he does like some break and runs. Um, he's participated in some live streams, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So all kinds of cool stuff. Um, we've got a fantastic crew of people here that try to do what they can to give back to the um, uh, to the pool community. Uh, Robin Barnes is another one of my fellow Texans um, that um, has a YouTube channel. He mostly, uh, I've seen him post uh, stuff that he just basically practices on. Doesn't really, doesn't really do any interactions with the camera. Just kind of has the camera pointed at him as he's like maybe practicing a stroke or whatever, but he does have a couple of videos. Uh, TRMR stands for talking runs and making runs. Uh, uh, they, they, cause it's they, um, it's, uh, there's, there's basically like the leader of the channel, but it's, um, uh, like two or three people that basically run that YouTube channel. Awesome stuff. Um, and we all just kind of piggyback off of one another um, and try to help uh, try to help each other grow um, and produce the content um, at which we produce. So every one of those um, that I've mentioned, be sure to go check out their channels. And I'm not telling you to subscribe to them. What I'm telling you is that if you check out their stuff, and you happen to like their stuff, then maybe consider giving them a subscription and follow along every time that they publish a new video. The same goes for me. If any of y'all 
uh, that are in my live chat are new to my channel. You liked that first match that we went through. You like this interaction uh, that I do here because I try to do this on a regular basis. Um, you know, then consider subscribing to the channel um, because I do this stuff all the time. I try to, and I also try to um, do some lessons. I, I, I um, if you go through my channel, you'll see a bunch of different pool lessons on like how to draw the ball, how to follow the ball, how to jump the cue ball, how to perform mass a shots, how to perform bank shots, kick shots, combos, caroms, like every type of mechanic that you can think of in the game. I have tried my best at breaking it down so hard to where if you just follow the steps, you would hopefully be able to produce some type of result uh, depending upon what it is that you're trying to do. And then I've done some coaching uh, lesson videos before where people would send me videos of them playing and I would give them some sort of critique, much like how I'm reviewing my own uh, matches where I'm kind of critiquing myself. But I don't do the coaching uh, lessons anymore because too many people were sending me videos and I couldn't, I couldn't keep up. Uh, with all the requests i actually have four three or four more coaching lesson videos left to do before i'm completely done because these are people that have, that have sent me their videos when i was accepting them these last four that i have left are over a year old that's how far behind i usually am at trying to produce uh, record the content and, and then be able to publish the uh, publish the videos they check in on me from time to time saying like you know where are you at what you know when when's my video going to be get done and i i feel so bad when it's like you know i've i've produced video after video after video but i just haven't been able to uh do the review on them but fortunately um within a given year i mean there's possibilities that a player can have dramatic improvements um in their game but you know, there's there's also the possibility that whatever they performed um, in their videos, I would still be able to uh, give them some type of critique uh, that would still be able to help their game, whether they've already solved it or not. But uh, the reason why these last four have taken me the longest, though, is because uh, these uh, last four were requested that myself and my buddy Demetrius and Nate from the Cue It Up Network we review these together. So I've actually had some coaching lesson videos that I started a long time ago by myself. And then eventually when I met Nate from the Cue It Up Network, Nate introduced me to Demetrius. And then we started collabing um, on my channel to where you basically get three different perspectives of taking someone's game, dissecting it, and then offering three different types of advices, um, advice uh, to help the player um, improve. So when you're hearing all this stuff, this is the stuff that I produce. So if you're brand new to my channel and you like what you're hearing, that's why I would say consider subscribing. So that way you can just follow along every time I publish something new. <clears throat> okay. Ugh. I'm running out of breath. You know what? Let's go to another match. What do you say? Let's switch over to this and let's reset. Oh, I did not mean to do that. Hold on a second. I messed something up. Uh, get all this ready and see what it looks like. Okay, that looks fine. Whee! Okay, nothing looks out of the ordinary. It's just when I type certain things, I want to make sure like everything's all nicely lined up um, and, and not off to one side or because I'm very um, OCD about that stuff. Like I want to make sure that, you know, the, my, my name is, you know, sitting directly in the middle. You can you can kind of see like I'm not so picky because like I can tell that this big zero here in the middle is just slightly off to the left. But I'm not going to worry about moving it uh, slightly more to the right just so it's absolutely centered uh, in, in the uh, in the scoreboard. But. Here we are with another match. And in this match up here, I am playing up against a skill level six this time. So the race is going to be my five to their four. Now, I happened to turn on my camera after we lagged. And so clearly you can see I'm not the one breaking here. So I lost the lag. So now we're gonna have inning counts um, after every time that I missed. So let's see what happens here with this match up here. And this is a guy that I've, uh, I've played against before. I think I have maybe two videos um, against um, this opponent here. I actually have one really, really funny video um, against uh, this opponent here because it's where I knocked in the eight ball early. 
I completely forgot uh, that I had one more solid left on the table. And when he missed, the eight ball was just sitting in a pocket. I just walked right up to the table and just shot the eight ball. And when I shot the eight ball, I saw my ball and kind of just kind of collapsed onto the table and just started dying laughing, not realizing that, oh my gosh, I just accidentally lost the game because I spaced out and didn't realize I had another ball. Um, but like I said, I play this guy um, a couple of times whenever we're playing up against this team here. So let's see how this matchup goes. All right, did he make a ball? He's coming back to the table, so I guess he did. What's on the table? It looks like he stripes. Now, you see here now, uh, just like in my last match, like he immediately comes to the table and starts shooting, right? It's not like there's anything wrong with that because if you're at least able to come up with a plan like that fast, that I mean, cool, but... You'll see from me, like whenever I come to the table, I'm walking around the table. I'm, you know, making sure I understand where all of my balls are at um, on the table. And then I come up with some sort of plan because like right now, when I'm watching this, I'm wondering what is he going to do with that 14 ball? Because you can see it looks like he tried to uh, break it out, um, but he ends up missing uh, his 12 ball. So now I get to come to the table and I don't really see that I have an issue on the table. With the exception of because of where the cue ball's at, I don't really see that I have a decent opening shot. <laughs> what do I end up doing here? Wouldn't be smart for me to try the 4-1 combination. Am I going to go look at it? You see, I'm walking all over the table and, uh, and, and really, really trying to figure out what I'm going to do first. But what am I doing? I'm staring at the two ball. Am I going to, okay, I'm going to try to bank the two ball into the uh, side pocket. I probably have a little bit of right spin um, on the cue ball here. Let's watch the cue ball. Yeah, that's definitely some right spin. And I ended up under banking it. Because look, if I'd have made the ball, easy shot on the six, maybe a shot on the three ball. Who knows, who knows what I would have done um, after that. Uh-oh. So my opponent, um, I ended up uh, probably almost selling out the rack there because my opponent uh, shoots his stripe in. Didn't get the best of positions um, on the 14 ball. Looks like the 14 ball is at least cuttable to the top left corner pocket. Cue ball is probably going to run into the five ball. But then what happens after that? Does the five ball run into the eight? Where does the cue ball go after it hits the five ball? It's got a lot of top spin. Cuts the ball in. Yeah. See what I mean? Now. That was actually pretty good considering that the eight ball knocks in my six ball and now the eight ball has a pocket, but it doesn't look like he can shoot at it. It looks like the three ball's in the way. I don't know who who would who would have uh, yeah, he's gonna try to kick it in. Who would have tried to mass aid or, or curved around the three ball? Any takers uh, in the chat? Who would have tried to uh curve the cue ball into it? So you see, he tries to kick the eight, ends up hitting the side rail, and then hitting the eight, no contacting, no rail um, after that. So now I'm at the table, and I've got ball in hand. So, <laughs> as I'm like, what am I going to do? Uh, same question uh, that I've asked before. It looks like y'all already see. Um, let's let that person go by. I'm going to be starting with the three ball. What would everybody else start with? You got ball in hand. What kind of pattern uh, uh, would you uh, would you think that you would run? Because if I'm playing the three ball, see that the three ball is going here. More than likely going to have my cue ball just come up and probably stop right here. I can shoot the seven. I can shoot the two. What would y'all start with? Would y'all also start with the three? Or would y'all do something else? Let me know. Robert Bart says he would play a safety. <laughs> what kind of safety would you play, Robin? Maybe put the uh, put the cue ball right here and kind of just bank the one ball up like this and try to get the cue ball to just tuck right in after <laughs> after that. When you got ball in hand, you got a wide open table. <laughs> oh, I love it. 
Uh, let's see. Corner four billiards says three, two, four, one, seven, five, eight. So we got three, two. That means the four goes over here. The one's got to go over here. Seven, five, eight. I like that. I don't, see, I don't see any issue with that. Nate would also start with the three. Kevin Milhouse says he would start with the one. So, again, there's nothing wrong with starting with the one. But what will you do with the three? Right? I ask that because think of the type of work that you have to put in in order to be able to get the three ball available. Because after you play the one, maybe play the four, maybe play the two. You might have a shot at the seven to go over here, which means if you're at least the cue ball somewhere right here, you might be able to just kind of separate these two. But then where does the three ball go after that? Right? Those are things that you should consider when you're thinking about what is the ball that you're going to start with first. And what I typically like to advise is that you start with the ball that is the hardest to play position on, if you're able to. Because clearly, if a ball that you want, to, that, that is yours, is cluttered up, that's not a ball that you're going to be shooting at, right? Because you're not going to, you're not just going to shoot the, shoot, uh, hit your ball that's in a clutter and hope that it's going to go in. What you'll probably be looking for is a ball that you can play and break the clutter out at the same time. But in situations like this, since I have no clutters, um, I, uh, the three ball is the hardest ball for me to play position on, even um, if, if I were to try to construct some other type of pattern. That's why I start with the three ball. And then let's see what happens after that. So, probably, like I said, a little bit of top spin as my cue ball tries to roll forward. Oh, I even grazed the two ball. I bet that was a mistake. But uh, corner four billiard just said the two balls next. You can see I'm going to shoot the two ball next. Didn't really get uh, the angle that I want. <laughs> and I end up dog I end up dogging the ball. <laughs> ball in hand. I'm I'm a seven and I got ball in hand. <laughs> I only made one ball. Oh my gosh. <laughs> How bad is that? But fortunately, fortunately, my opponent doesn't have a shot. <clears throat> Let's see what's gonna happen here. I can't even tell if uh, like how much does my seven ball block him. And what do y'all what do y'all do in situations like this, right? Um, when you're when you're playing against, a, we'll just say a strong player. It looks like we got a timeout here. Uh, when you're playing against a strong player, and even even if this was a purpose safety. Right, I got I got a lucky safe because one I'm not even supposed to miss the two ball I'm still supposed to be at the table but luckily I got a little safe here. Do y'all try to go for like do y'all try to go for the win or um, how many of y'all would try to go for the win and how many of y'all would basically just not want to foul? And so by not wanting to foul you can possibly possibly just slide right past my seven ball maybe clip the eight and the eight go, goes something like this and have the cue ball do something like this and hope. That I don't run and hope that I don't run the table after that, right? What would y'all do here? See, looking at what he's talking, look at what he just did. He's looked like he's trying to do this. He wants to two rail kick the eight ball like this into the corner pocket, right? To go to go for the win. But what would y'all do? Would y'all go for the win? Look at that! Holy cow! That was really freaking good. Would y'all go for that, or would y'all just try to make sure that you hit the ball? Um, and not and not commit a foul. And really, you, you should almost answer that question um, not knowing, the, the, like the skill level of your opponent should be irrelevant. Just what would you do in that situation, regardless if you're playing up against a higher skill level player or a lower skill level player. Now, can y'all imagine what ball is going to be last? Now, what do we got here? It looks like a little bit of top spin. I'm going to play the one ball into the bottom right corner pocket. Or what, did I say right spin? A little bit of top spin. Make sure the cue ball comes out towards the middle of the table so I have a shot at the four ball so we can see that the seven ball is going to be the ball that I used last. I can see that I got some bottom spin. What am I doing here? 
bottom right spin, spin the cue ball two rails around. I have a natural angle into the seven. The cue ball will go into the rail and then just come back out and I play the eight ball into the same corner pocket as the seven. Pretty much like that. Oh, and I, I, I completely forgot. Um, if you saw in the, um, if you saw in the, uh, the last game and in this game, we're not marking the pocket with some sort of personal object. Typically, that is what you're supposed to do um, in, uh, in APA. But usually what ends up happening um, is that when uh, you have like fives and above, uh, and, I, and I don't really see it usually from fives, but sixes and above uh, will agree to just call the pocket. Um, but when we play like in playoffs or cities, let alone at Vegas, there's there's no calling the pocket like you have to mark the pocket and I actually did have someone uh, comment on one of my matches before to where like um, I should I should be leading by example uh, because I don't want other people to get the idea that well since I can since I'm doing it they should be able to do it um, and they're not wrong that 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 is a perfectly valid statement to make my only counter to that would be is it's one of those like do as I say not as I do. Uh, type of thing because when I am playing at cities when uh, uh, I, I didn't get to play at nationals but when I was when I when I got to when I played at cities uh, in order to get to nationals I did always mark my pocket and then sometimes even at the local level I do like I just I just for, it just ends up being a natural thing to where like when I get on the eight ball I'll just like grab my phone or grab my wallet and just place it on the table I don't even I don't even bother asking um, if uh, if it's okay to just uh, call the pocket or not. <clears throat> Ooh, a little hop, skip, and a jump. Now you can see the similarities between uh, this opponent here and even the last opponent. Like, they're like rapid players. Like, they play fairly fast. Good shot at the three. And do you see something similar to what we saw in the last rack? Right? My, my, my opponent clearly can run. Like, he can make some balls. But then what happens when he comes down to one last ball there's a six ball tucked behind my 11 ball here what happens when you can't figure out what to do with it or you leave it last like he did i mean he tried to break it out but he also tried to break it out last he didn't deal with it as soon as possible so now he's forced to do something which means i get to come to the table i have a lot of balls on the table so i can either play super aggressive and try to run out or I could play smart, make a ball here and there, play some sort of safety to where he has to kick at his ball again, maybe get ball in hand again, right? These are positions that you really, really do not want to put yourself in. If you know you're not going to be able to finish the table, don't just start arbitrarily knocking balls off of the table um, and then uh, and then just end up giving the uh, table back to your opponent. Now, I actually want to go back a couple of shots here because I did try to update the cue ball diagram as I'm sitting there just rambling on and on and on. Because look what happens here. So he makes a legal hit, sends the cue ball down table. And so look at the mess that I basically have to deal with. And I already come to the table with a plan on how to deal with it. So I think even with this first opening shot here, I think the idea was I wanted the cue ball to come over here and try to just break this stuff open. So I just use a little bit of a rolling cue ball, but I don't break it open, right? I run into that 11 ball, 11 ball just field goals its way between the, the six and the 13. So when I play this 14 ball, I play this with some top left spin so I can get the cue ball around the nine and I get perfect position on the 13 ball. I know it doesn't look like I can see the 13 ball, but I can. And so look what I do with it. A little bit of top spin. And now the rack is solved, provided, of course, that I do not mess up in any sort of execution. Right? Those are the types of strategies that you want to have that you that before you even take the first shot, right? Because unlike what my opponent did, he was going with shot after shot after shot and then end up ending with like his critical moment to where if he doesn't do what he needs to do, he's more than likely going to lose the game. Whereas when I did what I did here, now all I got to do is make sure that I don't mess up because at least when I broke out that clutter, I had multiple options. I didn't have a single option. I had multiple options, but then I can just try to come with some sort of pattern that allows me to be able to finish the rack. I think this is a little bit of bottom spin. 
I think all I do here is just draw the cue ball back and shoot the eight ball into the same pocket, just like the, the last game where the eight ball goes into the, the same pocket um, as the last ball. So a lot more bottom spin on this one. Oh, a little bit of right spin too, since I had a, a bit of a cut angle there. And then again, just another stop shot or draw shot, whatever. All right, but does that make sense uh, when it when it comes to when it comes to strategy on like how to um, approach the table? I know it's very easy to just come to the table and just start shooting balls in left and right. But then you realize that, oh, like, and, and you think to yourself that uh, I'm going to pause it uh, right here as I talk about this. You think that you're doing something good because you're just making balls left and right, and you're thinking that you're ahead, which technically you are, right? You've got one or two balls left on the table. Your opponent has seven. So technically you're ahead. But what I always like to teach my APA players is that you're at a disadvantage because if you don't finish the table and your opponent has seven balls left on the table, they're either going to accidentally save you. How many of y'all have been in games where you're just sitting there like you're getting hooked one after another, after another, after another, depending upon the skill level uh, of your of your opponent, because they've got all their balls on the table and you're and you're chasing after one or two balls or you're chasing after the eight ball. Right. That's why you got to be very careful, at least in eight ball, about just shooting balls in. You have to know if you're going to be able to finish the table or not. And if you know, if you can say to yourself and be honest with yourself that you can't finish the table or you're not capable of finishing the table, then if anything, you probably should just make like a ball or two and then try to improve the position of another ball, which means you're giving your opponent the opportunity to come back to the table. But that's why you also have to be aware of where their balls are at. Like how tough is their run out? Do they have any trouble spots that they have to deal with? Because if they do, then you can probably at least have a pretty good gamble that you'll come back to the table and it'll be an improved table because they're going to knock their balls off the table, which is going to take obstacles away from you from having to maneuver around the table and stuff and possibly give you a better chance at finishing the table when you come back. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're, when you're playing your eight ball games, you know, like if you see that, Oh, like I can run five balls out, but I don't know what I'm going to do after that. If you come into scenarios like that, then chances are you shouldn't run those five balls out that you, that you say you can run. You should probably just make one or two or, or one or the two that you don't know what to do with. Maybe try to um, push them out into the open and, uh, um, you know, play some sort of simple safety or whatever. Because when you look at the, the layout that your, that your opponent has, make some sort of judgment as to, well, are they going to be able to finish the table? Right. And and usually you want to that type of call, that type of gamble. You do want to make that on on a skill level basis. Right. Because when you think about it, if you're playing up against a skill level two to a skill level four, more times than not, if all seven of their balls are on the table, they're probably not going to finish the table. They're probably not going to come to the table and run out, right? That's that's just a reality. I don't mean to say that as an insult because is it possible? Sure, it's possible, but the probability of it is probably pretty freaking low. But when you're up against skill level five, skill level six, skill level seven, then you really have to be careful when you're making decisions like that, right? Because you saw here, like in that last rack for me, I was able to figure out how to open the table back up and finish the table. Those are the types of gambles that you want to be able to take, especially with the whole rant that I'm making right now about when you clear the table off, which you think you're doing a good thing for yourself, it's actually a good thing for your opponent if you don't end up finishing. I hope that makes sense. Let's see how this break goes. I think I'm up two to zero, three innings. Look at that cue ball. And I broke dry. I gotta, let's look at that again. Like this is the type of break that I look for all day long. And I, <laughs> and I end up breaking dry. Watch that cue ball. A little bit of top spin. The weight pops it back and bam, that top spin fights back and halts it right in the middle of the table. But I, but I break dry. So, so what? <laughs> but my opponent gets to come to an open table. I would much rather have my cue ball do that and make a ball. So that way, hopefully I can break and run the table. But let's see what happens here. Uh, 
Robin Barnes says he likes stripes. I, I, I agree. Stripes looks really good. 14 ball in the side pocket. Okay, my concern is these two balls up here now based on the pattern uh, that he's choosing. Let's see what he does here with this 15 ball. Kind of just pinches it there. He's not going to be playing this. He's got to be playing the 14 ball. Okay, good shot. But see, it, it, it's, it's the same thing, right? Are we, we're basically seeing the same mistake. And... Not that, like, I almost made that shot, but we're seeing almost the same mistakes over and over again, aren't we? Right? Like, my, my opponent is a good shot maker, but it looks like his planning could use a little bit more work. Because, again, now look at me. So, like, my problem that I have at the table is the eight ball and my four ball. Everything else looks fine. So, when I come to the table, I have to come up, like, right now, you see, like, I'm not just getting down and just shooting shots. I am literally trying to map out a path that's going to allow me to finish the entire table. Now, not everybody can do this, right? I don't expect skill level two, skill level threes to do this. Like that's asking a little too much because they're still learning like, you know, how to how to aim, how to how to hit the cue ball, top spin, bottom spin, you know, but these are things that you should be working towards. So when you see stuff like this, hopefully you can basically just do this stuff in practice. And when you do this stuff in practice, you're gonna be playing really, really slow. But that's why you practice it. So that way you can you can learn to process all these things and come up with all these plans quicker and quicker and quicker. So let's see how I try to develop this rack here. Uh, what is that? Is that is that a little bit of topspin? Yeah, a little bit of topspin as I almost broke out the eight ball. Ooh, I remember this shot. Watch this, y'all. I think I, I think you'll like this. I would I would have to I would have to ask what do you think I'm about to do here? As I'm waiting for someone on the next table uh, uh, to shoot, what do you think I'm gonna do here? You should see the. Ooh, it looked like I was gonna draw the ball there. But look at the if you see the cue ball diagram, watch what's gonna happen. Oh, that was so pretty. That was so pretty. Let's look at that again. Watch the cue ball's hesitation after it after it hits the rail. Look at that. Gently little bump on the four ball. Get it right back out into the open. And now I got to figure out what am I going to do with the eight ball. As we can see, I'm going to shoot the three ball next. Uh, let's see, what am I doing here? A little bit of top spin, it looks like. Uh, that looked like I might have rail first it. Um, I might have hit the short rail first. Um, and then just with some uh, top right spin, get the cue ball just a little bit further away from the uh, from the rail. So now it looks like I'm shooting the six ball. Uh, what am I doing? Is that just a little bit of a rolling cue ball? Nope, stun shot. Uh, so a little bit of draw. Got good position on the five ball. What in the world am I going to do with the eight ball? So it looks like I'm looking to see what kind of setup I can get myself on the four ball. Looks like I got some top spin on the five. Okay, it looks like I'm at least on the angle at which I... Um, wanted to have on the four ball what am i about to do here that looks like looks like a little bit of bottom am i about to do a drag shot yeah that had to have been a drag shot oh i must have wanted to be like right here like yeah because i'm calling the eight ball down here i wanted the cue ball to be right around here so i can have a straighter shot um at the eight ball to go into the corner pocket but remember I wouldn't even be here if I didn't knock that four ball loose the, the way that I did. Uh, what is that? It looks like that's a rolling cue ball. Ooh, 
clean into the pocket. Man. All right, cool. So I think that puts me up three to zero. So I hope everything I'm saying uh, makes sense. Right. And, you know, so th these are things that I obviously um, not obviously that I that I, I, I have these discussions like with my opponents, with with my um, local league players about like this is how I strategize eight ball racks. Um, and um, and I, I let them know, like, this is how you should try to approach the table to increase your chances of winning, um, because, again, it's it's very easy to come into the illusion of. Look at that. Did the same thing. Got the cue ball to kind of stop near the middle of the table. At least made a ball this time. But it's very easy to fall into the illusion of that since you're running the table and you're ahead of your opponent, you think you're going to win. When in reality, uh, you're you're actually behind. You know, and when you only got one ball left on the table, you're actually hoping that your opponent is going to make some sort of mistake that allows you to shoot that last ball. And then, and then possibly win the game, which means you're not in control of the rack. And that's why you don't want to do that stuff, because you always want to try to stay in control of the rack. What am I doing here? Like, I did I make a stripe on the break, or did I missed I missed that 15 ball? Yeah, so I guess I was striped. And let's look at that again. Like, why did I shoot the 15 ball? Based on where I'm at. I could have shot this ball, maybe. Look, if I would have made the 15 ball, the cue ball would probably be in a slightly different position, but I might have had position on this 12, and I shoot the 12 in, and then the rack is solved, right? Every Everything's out in the open um, after after I do that. That's why I ended up choosing uh, the 15 ball first. Oh, my opponent tries to muscle that 7 ball in. So now I've got this to deal with. Everything else, Everything else looks fine. Let's see how I try to how I try to deal with this area here. Uh, what am I doing? Is that ten ball in the side pocket? Probably with just a rolling cue ball. Ten ball on the side. Cue ball is just rolling around. Might have might have had a twist of right spin um, on it when it came off of uh, this bottom rail here. Now I've got position on the 11 ball. What am I? What am I? What am I gonna do here? Like most of the time, I would I would have to think like yeah, because now I'm about to come over here and look to see like where are my where are my available positions to be able to shoot these balls. So if I'm playing if I'm playing the the 11 ball next, I I, I have to think that I'm getting position on one of these two stripes here. Uh, that looks like a rolling cue ball. And I had to have screwed up since I since I hit the seven ball. I probably wanted to get the cue ball right here, just underneath the eight ball, so that way I can shoot the twelve ball. But I, I had to have screwed up. So now it looks like I'm calling an audible. So I'm going to be shooting the thirteen ball here into the bottom right corner pocket. Uh, what is that? Some top right. Yep. As the cue ball comes around, probably did not get the position that I was wanting. And see, now I'm doing what I don't, what I basically advised against. I should have stopped somewhere because my opponent's not going to do anything with this three ball or unless he shoots the four and breaks out the three. Let's see what I'm still doing here. A little bit of draw, it looks like. Stunned over to the side rail. Do I have a shot at the, at the 15 ball? I guess I do. 15 in the corner. What am I doing with the cue ball? That looks like a rolling cue ball. Oh, I'm going short side position. So 12 ball is going to be going over here. And look, like, what? it would have been better if I would have just scooted forward just another, just another inch or two. Just another inch or two. Now it looks like I'm going to cut it in and I I have to be wanting to hit my have my cue ball run into the 4. If I run into the 4 ball and make my 12, I'm golden. Just like that. If that 12 goes, then golden. 8 ball same corner pocket.
There we go. Now, do y'all see how that could have went all kinds of wrong because of that little area that I had there with the with those um with those two uh with those two stripes? <clears throat> yeah, corner four billiards. When you run the table and can't finish nine out of ten times, you will lose. I I agree with that statement. So here I am on the hill, so going to try for an eight ball break. So bottom spin with a twist of right spin. There's that eight ball. And I made a solid, it looks like. Two, four, six. Yeah, I'm solids. And I don't really see an issue with solids. Do y'all? And see, I almost just zoned in on the six and just started shooting. And now again, I'm going to go back through my same routine and make sure that I have a plan for all of the balls. Like, what am I going to do with a five ball? But it looks like I'm just going to play a stop shot on the six. Well, stun, stop, stun, whatever. A little bit of below center. Does that mean I play the, do I play the combo or do I play the seven? Play the seven ball, looks like with a rolling cue ball. So a little bit of top spin or above center. Bump into the five ball. Five ball's now out in the open. And don't really think I want my cue ball tied up next to, next to that 13 ball. Ugh. And then I'm coming down here for the four. What am I doing? Oh, and I tried to muscle the four in. Would have got position on the, the three ball. Probably would have shot the three next, then the five, then the one, and then maybe the eight. Okay, draw shot off of that stripe there. Let's see how my opponent tries to pick apart this rack. Okay, so far so good. I like the way this is looking. Probably would end up taking the 10 ball next and trying to get the cue ball to come two rails around like this. Land somewhere over here for the for these three other stripes. Oh, he overhit it. Cue ball went exactly where I thought, but he overhit it. He's got a shot at this. Uh, what is that? That's the 14 ball to go here into the bottom left. Cue ball comes over to the side rail and come back out. Kind of like that. That's well done. Now this is starting to get questionable. Uh, unfortunately, because of the position that he got on the 11. Ooh, tries to get position for the 9, possibly to go into the side pocket. Was he banking the 9? Oh, holy cow! Awesome shot by my opponent. Is he going to bank this one too? Oh my goodness, wow. Oh man. But you miss a shot like that and you leave me four balls out in the open. I should be able to finish the table here. Three ball into the corner pocket, five balls next, most likely one ball next, and then the four, and then the eight. I have to, I have to look again. Let's go back um, real quick because I want to see if my opponent would have made this bank shot. He might have had a shot at he might have had a shot at the eight ball to go into the uh, into the into the corner pocket. So that last bank shot was crucial. So rolling shot uh, rolling cue ball on the three, probably the same thing on the five, maybe more towards the center because I just have the cue ball hit the uh, short rail and just come straight down towards the middle of the table for position on the one. As I'm waiting for um, someone on the uh, other table to shoot. Yeah, Robin Barnes, you're saying counterclockwise. That's pretty much the direction uh, that I'm going to be uh, taking this pattern in. All right, so a twist of right spin on that one. Here I can just play a, uh, probably just a rolling cue ball as the cue ball will just go over to the side rail and come back out for position on the four. Just like that. Probably, that was more of a, 
probably more of a stun shot than a than a rolling cue ball. Same thing there, stun shot with a little bit of right spin. Small back cut angle on the uh, eight ball to go into the uh, top left corner pocket. Probably just a little bit of draw. And there we go. So I was able to take that one down five to zero. And I think the the inning count was six. So if, if I had to give any type of advice uh, to my opponent, I think I pretty much uh, well covered it. We saw that my opponent can shoot. Like, in, I mean, he had that bank shot, almost back-to-back -back bank shots, and would have got position on the eight. And my opponent can run, right? Able to put together some really good runs, but not able to finish the runs. And not finishing those runs cost him the racks against a player like myself. Now, perhaps other uh, team, uh, other opponents uh, that he might have been up against before, that type of game works just fine but against someone like myself it doesn't and that's why skill level really shouldn't matter because if you play a certain way that basically beats the top player then that means you're going to beat everybody below the top player so i know there, there's usually like this um this idea to where like you play to the strengths of your opponent i, I don't really agree with that statement Right, because there's a lot of times where someone might say that, um, like if you play a lower skill level player, they will bring your skill level down because you lackadaisically play against them, right? Because like, you you have this attitude like I'm coming back to the table no matter what. But so you so you play more aggressively, you take you take more dangerous shots, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I just look at that as uh, giving you the opportunity to build up bad habits, right? When you should really basically play that lower skill level player. As if you're playing against yourself and if you're making decisions against a lower skill level player that you would not make against a higher skill level player you might want to consider changing your thought process and always play everybody as if they're as if your opponent is better than you and always play smart because if you can say to yourself that you're playing up against a lower skill level player then you should be able to just beat them as if they were just uh, another skill level seven or a skill level uh, skill level six right always play your best always play the smartest in games like this for eight ball running the table though it's cool and all but if you don't finish the table up against the wrong opponent and i'm not even talking about a skillful opponent i'm talking about a smart opponent running the table and not finishing is not the best thing in the world that you can do because even a smart player will know to play a defensive shot here and there and basically set up the table for them to be able to run the table so I hope that's at least some solid advice that everybody in the chat can hopefully benefit from. Now, let's go back to this. And let's talk to everybody before we do the final match. Ah, oh, okay. What did everybody think of that one? Like, would y'all agree uh, with um, like my advice and like you know the just the the the, the idea of strategy in in eight ball and actually how many of y'all um, can admit that you play the way that I'm advising you not to play? Like, how many of y'all would be able to admit that that you do try to just run 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 run, but you knowing your opponent, you're, you, 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 have, you have this idea that your opponent is most likely going to let you back to the table. And so just running the table and not finishing the table works fine for you. How many of y'all actually try to do that? Yeah, co uh, coders for life play the play the same regardless of the opponent. That's that's exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Jeremy Carrera, why do I always wiggle my fingers on my bridge hand when shooting? It's just a habit. Um, a lot of um, a lot of my teammates like to say that I'm casting a spell as my uh, fingers are are moving around. Um, I'm a very I guess you could say I'm a very fidgety uh, type of person. 
Um, I used to be a percussionist uh, when I was in um, middle school and high school and stuff. And so like my, my hands are always like constantly moving um, and, and whatnot. And I, I think I can also say that I've seen other players do it. And I think I just happen to just pick it up as a habit. And it doesn't affect my game. I, I've had some people say that it that uh, they believe it affects my game, but I, I don't think that it does. Um, so like when I'm doing um, any types of bridge, you'll see like my, my ring finger kind of curl like this or something, or I might just kind of, you know, just kind of like spider walk my fingers um, as, as it's on the table. But then when I shoot, like everything's perfectly still. It's not like my hands are moving while, while, while I'm taking my final stroke, but it's just a habit. Uh, that I, I've I've never once tried to break. <clears throat> so Kevin Millhouse, you say I have. I'm I'm assuming that uh, you you have uh, tried playing the game the way I advise not to, where you, you just try to run, 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 and then when you realize that you're done anyway, you just do something. Either you try to play a defensive shot, or you try to just break out whatever it is that you're that you're not able to finish at the table in hopes that you're going to get back to the table. Like I said, that is an okay strategy to have against the right opponent. But against the wrong opponent, that is not the type of strategy that you should try doing. It will cost you more racks than anything else. <clears throat> Kyle Kerr, you won your match tonight because your opponent scratched on the eight. I mean, sometimes that happens. Sometimes that happens. <clears throat> so, hopefully, just like if if you try to if you try to use the strategy at which I'm suggesting, it might feel awkward because uh, you're 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 gonna sit there and say to yourself, "I can run like two or three more balls. Like, why am I gonna stop here? Like, that's a that's a hard thing to." I can appreciate how that might be a hard thing to 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 battle against, but like really, when you're thinking about it, your objective is not to run three balls and 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 stop because you because you can't do anything else after that. Your objective is to win the rack, right? So that that that's where that's where that strategy comes into play. Um, I think Corner Four Billiards said uh, said it earlier. Like most people try to look cool or fancy being able to run the table, which it is. It does look cool and fancy to to be able to run like five or six balls, but you know what's cooler? winning the rack because it, it would kind of suck running five or six balls and then you lose the rack because you don't look cool or fancy if you lose even after you ran five or six balls right that's that's the whole idea your main objective is to win the rack and if you do not currently have the skill set to run racks break out trouble balls and you know do whatever it is you need to do like you see me doing here don't try to do it play smarter and then um and then hopefully be able to win racks because um, I like the 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 statement here from Kevin Milhouse. You get uh, you guess it's like chess. Absolutely. In cases where you're you know you can admit to yourself, you can be honest with yourself that you cannot finish the table, then you're going to try to set the table up where you're gambling that your opponent is not going to run the table. And if your gamble is correct, hopefully your the table is now set up for you to attack. And finish the table. So it's very much like playing chess, where you're just setting your pieces up and getting ready to attack. Very, very, uh, very much so. Very much so. Ah, <clears throat> uh, let's see. What do we got here? I'm gonna scroll up and look and see if there's some other questions that I might have missed. Hope everybody's uh, enjoying themselves. I see that we have 91 people um, in here, and I've got 72 likes. Y'all are absolutely amazing. Absolutely love it. I hope everybody's enjoying themselves. Let's see. Not really seeing anything uh, up above. Scroll back down. <laughs> Corner for billiards. You don't have to be a gunslinger to win a rack. Hashtag period. Don't you have a YouTube video that you've titled You Don't Have to Be a Gunslinger? Or or something to something to that nature. You're you're about to make me go look it up. I I, I know I'm not uh, kidding myself here. Let's see here. And I'm right. You do have one. Where the heck is that video? There it is. 
know what? I got I got my boy here spouting out his own words. So do me a favor, y'all. Go check out that video uh, that I that I posted um, of his. You don't have to be a gunslinger. And like I said, I'm not telling you to subscribe to him. I'm telling you that if you like what you see on his channel, then consider subscribing to him. That's how this all works. Just like if you like what we're, what I'm doing here, if you're if you haven't subscribed to my channel, then consider subscribing. Uh, let's see here, Larson's Pool and Spa. How's it going? You're wanting to know what's my best stroke drill. Well, I talked about it earlier. I guess I'll pull it back up. Where is that? Where is that video? It's an old video of mine. It's called the three and one. Um, three and one stroke drill. I, th I think it's called the stroke drill. No, th I'm sorry. Three and one straight in drill. That's this video here. This is a drill um, that'll um, help you um, practice your stroke. Um, practice your stroke as well as pocketing a ball. Because uh, everybody, um, it, if you're, if you're, if you've been playing pool for a while, you should be familiar with very two or with very two commonly known um, stroke drills: the bottle drill, and then uh, shooting the cue ball into the rail and having it come back and hit your tip. All right, the bottle drill is you know simply taking a bottle of some sort, all right, set it down onto the table like this, and the opening of the bottle here is your cue ball. So you set your bridge hand apart and then you try to stroke your cue through the opening. Um, of the uh, the bottle without hitting the rim, but the idea is, like I said, the opening of the bottle is the cue ball. So your your objective is to actually stroke through it, get somewhere past the midpoint. Because remember, like here's the cue ball. Like the cue ball is about this side. So your follow through naturally should come through about here. So your objective would be to go through the opening of the bottle and end up right about here. Maybe even hit the back of the bottle without touching the rim of the bottle. That'll at least show you um, how straight your stroke is. Um, because obviously if you hit the rim of the bottle, then your, your stroke is not straight. You're going off to one side. You may be coming up, coming down. You know, so like when you do that over and over again, you're hopefully building up the muscle memory to keep your arm as straight as possible and go through the opening of the bottle. And then there's the, um, like I said, shooting the, the cue ball directly into a rail and have it come back and hit your tip. Uh, the easier uh, drill to that is just going the width of the table, like shooting into the long rail and having it come back because it's a shorter distance. But the, the real tester is when you shoot the length of the table. Have the, and hit the short rail and have the cue ball come back and hit and uh, hit your tip because if you're if you at least have a level table good rails and you're hitting the cue ball absolutely in the center of the table or center of the table absolutely in the center then the cue ball should hit the rail come back and hit your tip otherwise when it hits that rail it's going to veer off to one side and there's two reasons it does that there's not just one the 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 most common thing you would think of is you're hitting with side spin you're not hitting absolute center that is the obvious reason why it will come off to one side. The other not so obvious reason is because you're not actually shooting in a straight line. You don't realize that you're actually shooting off at a slight angle. Right? And if you're shooting at a slight angle, then clearly the angle that it's coming in is the angle that it's going to come out. Right? So you, you have to be very meticulous and make sure that you're shooting absolutely straight and then hitting absolute dead center of the cue ball when you do those. Now, if you check out the uh, three and one straight in drill, that's doing the same thing, plus pocketing a ball. Robin Barnes, thanks for stopping by, man. You have yourself a good night. <clears throat> Chris, if any of your friends ask you, why did I miss that shot? <clears throat> There's a number of reasons um, that, you, that you missed the shot. And so the, the, this is, um, I actually have an old, uh, one of my one of my older videos, uh, it's where I'm just like kind of doing a live stream um, and I'm just talking to the camera. And it's like basically one of the ideas of like, how do you get better? Um, because when when you miss a shot, you, you can't you can't just simply say, in my opinion, you can't just simply say to yourself, oh, I missed. Um, and you can't, you, you can't even say, I overcut the ball or I undercut the ball, right? Those are clear and obvious reasons why you missed right because if you overcut the ball or if you undercut the ball you miss aimed or you could have miss aimed 
if you're using side spin, you could be aiming correctly as if you weren't using side spin, but you could also be not compensating for the cue ball deflecting or what's also called squirting when you use side spin, right? That could be another reason why you missed. You could have missed because you think you're hitting the cue ball in the center, but if you don't have a straight stroke and you accidentally hit off center and the cue ball deflects, you end up missing, right? There's all kinds of different reasons why you actually could have missed other than saying you miss aimed because you overcut the ball or you undercut the ball. It, you really have to get down to the nitty gritty and absolutely understand what you're doing wrong. Because if you can at least eliminate all the variables, like you, you know that your, your, your stroke is straight, blah, 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 then you can just clock it up or um, pretty much wrap it all up and saying that you just didn't aim correctly, right? That, 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 and that's a thing. But the other thing as to why you missed, sometimes the ball that you miss is not the mistake that you made. And you might be thinking just like, well, what do you talk about? Like how, how, is, how is the ball that you missed not the mistake? Well, think about it. If the shot that you're attempting to make is a bank shot, or an 80 degree cut shot or whatever it's something that's really freaking difficult to execute what i would challenge you on is what were all the previous shots that you took that led up to that moment right because you can easily say that if you would have made the shot that you missed you might have been able to run the you might have been able to finish the table you might have been able to win the rack whatever right that that's easy right that's easy to say but if you look at all the steps that led up to that point to where now you're faced with a difficult shot, which one of those steps was actually the mistake? Because if you would have fixed any one of those steps, maybe you wouldn't have been left with a difficult shot. Maybe you would have been left with an easier shot and, you would have, and you'd be able to continue your run. And that's what I always like to say is like when, when, when you miss – sometimes that shot was not where you made your mistake. It, it, it could be the previous shot or it could be the previous series of shots. <clears throat> I, hope that, I hope that makes sense. Uh, uh, what do you mean, uh, but uh, come on, like did I, did I, did I miss something? I guess I guess I would have to ask like what what more are you looking for because I wouldn't I wouldn't know anything else beyond uh, how to explain that is there something I'm not thinking of because I certainly don't try to claim that I know everything. Does anybody else have anything that they they would add to that? See, corner for Billy, you're just saying being lazy in one of your steps uh, during your pre shot routine can cause you to miss the makeable shot. Absolutely. <clears throat> right, but, uh, it's not just eight ball 101. That's anything, period. Right? Because think about it in, in nine ball or 10 ball or whatever pocket billiard game that you're playing. Right? Because you're always trying to play from one shot to the next. It's not like you just shoot one shot and you're done. That's, the, that, that's your last shot. That's your money shot. Because prior to getting to the money shot, there's all those steps in between to where you're making, you know, in eight ball, you're making seven previous shots before you shoot the eight ball. In nine ball, you're making anywhere from uh, one, to, one to eight shots before you, get to the nine, before you get to the nine ball. And there's all these little – every little attempt that you make at the table potentially leads up to a reason why you missed. And like I said, it doesn't always have to uh, start with the ball that you missed. Most of the time it does. Most of the time it does. It would, if you have an absolute makeable shot, we're talking like, you know, 80 plus percent uh, that, that you're going to make. You set it up 10 times, you're supposed to make it 9 out of 10 times. Or you set it up 100 times, you're supposed to make it 99 out of 100. And there's just that one time that you missed. It's because you just missed. Well then, yeah, like th that that would be like the the moment you say, well, I, I just missed the shot. I think there was a shot that I had on that last one where I had ball in hand, right? I had ball in hand, I shot a ball in, got position on the next ball and missed and just missed, right? I can chalk that up to I missed um uh, uh, uh for for something like that, but for other players, um especially players that are learning, like I said sometimes that's just not the case. And 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 I always encourage them to really dig deep and try to understand 
what is the real reason why they're missing other than they're not aiming correctly. So I hope that makes sense. <clears throat> All right, let's see here. I think we're we're pretty much ready for the for the last match um, of the evening. We got one more. All right, let's see. I'm gonna look through a couple of more old chats. See if there's anything that I missed. Okay, so you were just hoping that I would share the straight stroke is the essence of billiards. I mean, of course that is, but here's here's the thing. I don't I don't know um I don't know how how, how much you you follow me uh in in the way that I explain things, but I'm also very very particular about words. And so when you say straight stroke we obviously understand that like when we're doing the bottle test or when we're doing, you know, whatever, you have to have a, a straight stroke. The, the cue's got to come straight back and straight through the cue ball, whatever, right? That, 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 that of course, makes sense. But what about when you apply side spin? The stroke, for, for, lack of, of, for, for lack of words, is not necessarily straight, if that makes sense, right? Because... You're not hitting the center of the cue ball anymore. You're hitting off center. And at, at, at the very least, depending upon, um, does any does everybody in here know the difference between front hand English and back hand English? Because right, um, if anybody that follows me knows that I'm a back hand English player, so the uh, or I'm mainly a back hand English player. Sometimes I have a little bit of front hand English when I actually do my shots as well. Uh, but that's the, and that would mean that if you're a backhand English player like myself, you know you're you're pivoting your cue from from your bridge and not really delivering it straight into the cue ball, but kind of straight at an angle, uh, if you will. And the 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 other thing though is is when when you're saying straight stroke is like let let's be real because I I'm not gonna hold anybody to the the professional standard like we're we're all amateur pool players here. Everybody in my chat has to know somebody, I would think, or has seen somebody that's very animated when they play, or ha um has seen somebody that has the shakes when they play. But they play phenomenally. They play awesome. Right, they run racks, blah blah blah, and everything else. What? They don't have the the straightest of strokes. Um, the a lot of the old time professionals. How many of y'all remember seeing some of the old time professionals? Like, um, I don't know if it was Eugene Puckett or um, like any of the legends of billiards. And what do they what do they do with their with their um, with their cue? When they're queuing up on the cue ball, do you ever know? You ever see one of those players where like they always put the tip of their cue on the table, like bottom left, but when they hit the cue ball, they pull it up and put top left, middle, bottom, like wherever they start their cue is not where they finish their cue. Would you describe that as a straight stroke? Now maybe you would sit there and say that final stroke was straight but like when you think about it like where the cue starts is dramatically different than where it finishes like is that a straight stroke and again that's just me being very meticulous about the the term straight stroke but like i said there are players that just know how to do that i mean efren reyes and francisco bustamante when they're doing all their practice strokes maybe their final stroke is as straight as they is as is, is as straight as they can be, but they're they're sitting there doing all this stuff with their practice stroke. Like the tip of their cue is like always at the 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 bottom of the cue ball, but then their that final stroke comes up and puts like a center ball hit, a top a top spin hit, you know, it's it's whatever it is. <clears throat> I hope that makes sense, right? Just hitting the ball straight and accurate is obviously the the essence of being able to um deliver the cue ball from point a to point b and, po and possibly be able to uh, make a ball we got a couple of people that don't know what uh front hand english and backhand english is so i'm going to 
reference a video. I will try to summarize uh, what I'm talking about real quick. But go check out this video here. It's my side spin on the cue ball. It's one of three videos that I have that have reached over a million views, um, but explains the difference between front hand English and backhand English. And simply put is this. Front hand English is when you place your bridge hand off center from the cue ball. So when you place the, uh, your bridge hand directly behind the cue ball, you're going to be hitting some form of center on the cue ball. But if you raise your bridge fing if you raise your fingers, then you're going to be putting top spin. If you lower your fingers, you're going to be putting bottom spin. But when you want to put side spin, you would shift your bridge hand to the left or the right of the cue ball and apply some sort of side spin. And when you do that, that's when you have to account for cue ball deflection. So if you put right spin on the cue ball or pff, right spin on the cue ball, the, the cue ball will deflect off to the left, and you have to compensate for that cue ball deflection because, like I said, that's going to be one of the reasons why you missed if you don't uh, compensate for that cue ball deflection. You see that all demonstrated in my side spin video. And if you put left spin on the cue ball, the cue ball is going to uh, squirt off to the right or deflect off to the right. But when you use backhand English, your bridge hand is placed to where you're cueing at the center. But then you move your grip hand and make your cue pivot to put left spin or right spin on the cue ball. That's pretty much what I do. I have my cue, my bridge hand is placed behind the center of the cue ball, and then I either put my, because I'm a right-handed player, I'll move my grip hand closer to my body, which causes my cue to pivot off to the my right, which means I'm going to be putting right spin on the cue ball. Or I'll slightly move my grip hand away from my body, which causes my cue to pivot to the left, which means I'm going to be putting left spin on the cue ball. And depending upon how much spin I want to put on the cue ball, that also might dictate whether or not if I slightly put my bridge hand a little off center so i use a little bit of front hand english and backhand english but one of the um one of the key things about using backhand english is that you don't really have to compensate for cue ball deflection cue ball squirt again you'll see all that being demonstrated in my uh side spin video because it kind of auto corrects itself to where like when you uh, put right spin on the cue ball you're kind of sending the cue ball off in one direction not necessarily a straight line but the cue ball deflects back into a straight line. So therefore you don't have to do so much compensation. But whereas when you're using front hand English, you do have to compensate for the cue ball deflection, cue ball squirt. So I hope that makes sense. Zach Smith, am I going to watch the Moscone Cup? Yes, in person, live. I am going to London uh, in December to watch the Moscone Cup. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going there with, uh, Nate, uh, from the queue it up network. Uh, so I'm going to get to meet team USA and team Europe. And I've actually got a couple of online buddies, uh, that I'm going to get to meet for the first time. I'm hopefully going to get to hang out with everybody, um, and see everything live. Don't really know if I'm going to be able to have any type of footage, uh, that I can record. Cause I'm pretty sure, uh, match room is going to have all their cameras and stuff and probably would not want spectators to run their cameras. You know, so if that's true, I'm going to be respectful and not do those things. But if I have opportunities to take pictures and maybe some clips um, here and there, I will certainly try my best and bring some stuff home to, to share with everybody. But we'll see. <clears throat> hey, Roger, you're, you're, you're jealous. I mean, I, I got lucky. I, I, I can only say that be, be, I'm only going to see the Moscone Cup because I became a YouTuber. Like, ever since I became a YouTuber, I, I, I've uh, I've been able to meet some wonderful people um, all across the country and across – well, I haven't met anybody across the world yet. Um, obviously, until I, until I go to London. Uh, but all over the country um, and, and have been able to like, you know, get some inside scoops, um, uh, has some have some connections um, in the industry and whatnot. And it, it, it's that has been one of the biggest blessings uh, that, that I've had uh, at becoming a, a YouTuber and doing like the pool instruction materials and stuff and, and gaining the popularity um, uh, that I've gotten is just being able to, you know, just meet all these people, um, especially to be able to be in closer contact with professionals. Because I've obviously met professionals. Like when I go to the Texas State Open, I get to meet some of the professionals. Um, but uh, with some of the other people uh, that I've met and uh, I get to, you know, actually have like, you know, actual conversations uh, with some of these professionals as well. It's just it's just been awesome. So like 
super looking forward uh, to going to the Moscone Cup um, this December in London. Um, and more than likely, um, you know, next year, if the Moscone Cup is here in Las Vegas, um, I'm more than likely going to be going to that as well. It's like once you do something once, you almost kind of have to repeat it again. All right. Enough blabbling. Blah. Let's get on going to the final match. What do y'all say? Hmm? And then we can wrap this stream up. Three, two, one. Whee! That code is for light hidden go hidden GoPro hat. I ha I have a GoPro. I don't know I don't know how well I can actually hide <laughs> hide it under a hat uh, to be able to record some stuff. But I don't know. We'll see. Like I said, well I'll, I'll do my best at, at, at what I can. I mean it, it's it's basically like a vacation, and I don't want my vacation to be like YouTube priority. Like I, I I'm not going over there to to make a YouTube video. I'm going over there to enjoy the Moscone Cup. Uh, meet some of the professionals uh, from both Team USA, Team Europe, and just you know have a good time. But I will I will take pictures in and any types of recordings that I possibly can, and if I can turn them into some sort of YouTube video, I will. Uh, much like all the pictures and little clips that I have of when I was in Las Vegas for the uh, APA Nationals, I still got to sit down and uh, make some sort of uh, um, video uh, for that, which is basically just like a a collage or whatever, just like you know a slideshow, if you will, for for a YouTube video. Now, for the final match, uh, in this matchup here, I am playing up against another skill level six. Um, so this is going to be a race to five four. And as you can see, I'm already set up to break. So I, this is another match where I turned on the camera like after after I um, had done the lag. Well, obviously, I won the lag here. So I'm st uh, this is still the same thing. Like this is the last match I was able to record uh, from the summer 2021 uh, session. And so after this, I can start looking at the current fall session that, that is uh, pretty much coming to an end. And I've got a couple of matches that I can uh, review uh, from there pretty much in the same format. So now in this matchup here, starting with the classic break like I did before, and if I get to the hill, then I will try to do an eight ball break. Let's see how I do. A little bit of top spin. Got the cue. Look at that. See that cue ball just kind of, I mean, it's slightly off to an angle, right? The cue ball kind of went slightly to the left, but then it's like you can just see how that top spin tries to fight back and hold the cue ball right near the middle of the table. That's always what I'm looking for. Uh, it looks like I'm starting with the 15 ball, maybe. Let's see again. I zone in on a shot, but then I'm like, wait a minute. But then I'm also checking to make sure, like, am I, am I going to be allowed to, to shoot stripes? Uh, what did I make? I think I made both solid and a stripe, didn't I? Yeah, so it's an open table. And look at that. Am I gonna am I gonna change my mind and go to solids instead? Looks like it. Looks like I switched to solids. Looks like I'm shooting the six ball into the uh, corner pocket. I'm just gonna roll the cue ball for the five in the side. It looked like maybe a bit of a stun shot. But five ball goes into the side pocket. Another rolling cue ball. You see me, I'm not really doing anything with the cue ball. Um, am I shooting the three or the two? It looks like I'm shooting the seven. This is probably with some bottom left spin. Okay, that should give me position on the three, but it looks like I'm shooting the one instead. A little bit of bottom spin. Yeah, so now I got to be shooting at the three. Is that just bottom spin as well, or do I have any side spin? Oh, bottom right. End up shooting the two ball last. Look at that. A lot of bottom spin on this shot. Draw the cue ball back. Eight ball in the side pocket. Start the rack off with the break and run. Now, do you see what I'm doing here where I, like, I just dropped myself down? You can't see my head. I remember this night. What ended up happening is right when I called uh, the side pocket, um, whoever's keeping score on uh, the, the, the opposing team, you see my opponent's laughing as well. 
uh, whoever's keeping score just shouted out zero before I even shot the um, the eight ball because they're basically calling out how many innings um, ha has has gone by so that way they can between the the my teammate uh, that's keeping score and the other teammate that's keeping score for them making sure that the inning count uh, matches and so before I even got to shoot the eight ball you just hear someone go zero and that broke my concentration and I had to just sit there and just start la and just laugh for a little bit regain myself and then just shoot the eight ball into the uh, into the side pocket that's what that pause was for so let's see if I can uh, squat the rock um, on this break Oh, look at that. Do I make a ball? Okay, I saw the six ball go into the uh, side. Almost make the eight ball in the side pocket. But like I said, I wish I can do this on a consistent basis. Look at that cue ball. Like, I, I just wish I can constantly repeat that. And I, and, and I can't. Like, sometimes I think... Sometimes I think I might because when I when I break with power, you know, I just I lose a little bit of accuracy on my stroke sometimes it or, or my aim. Like I said, because if the cue ball goes off to the left or off to the right, then my aim uh, might my, might be a little off. But like when 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 it's all on and I get that good hit on the cue ball and then you get a result that looks like this. All right. So three ball into the uh, corner pocket, bit of a stop shot there. Uh, coders for life we do still use paper the uh the the apa scoring app is currently not available uh in my area i wish it was but it's not okay that looked like a bit of a goof i must have had uh bottom and a just a probably a twist of left spin and i probably needed more left spin and what the heck was that I got a rolling cue ball. What am I doing? Ah, I tried to play a billiard off the two ball and be able to make the one ball into the corner pocket. But there's my first miss. And now my opponent gets to come to the table and have a go at strikes. Let's see what he does. What would y'all do? Doesn't have it doesn't doesn't have much to start with. Yeah, uh, coders for life. I honestly don't know like what areas have the app of it. Like I have the app on my phone. It just if I try to open it, it'll literally tell me it's not available in my area. Uh oh. Oh, my opponent's opening shot starts with a scratch. All right, so cool. Here in this spot here, since I have ball in hand, we'll stop right here. What do y'all do here? Is there an issue on the table? Or is the table just runnable? And do we just have to come up with a pattern to run? Like, what do y'all think? And remember, I'm solids, and and, and my my opponent uh, my opponent is stripes. Because for myself, this is an issue for me. I cannot remember if the eight ball can go straight down here. But even if it did, I personally do not like that shot. It's very easy to catch either of the points of this side pocket and you just end up missing right and uh I, obviously i can't I, I don't see a way that to where i can maybe hit the 15 and have it go in into the side or, or anything like that zach smith is may, uh, maybe uh talking about a potential safety um you have to be a little bit more specific like where would you um where would you um play the safety um kevin millhouse you're saying start with the two ball um i guess you're saying uh start with the two ball over here like, uh, what would what would be the the rest? Because what I'm explaining is that that I do not like this eight ball. The reason why I'm telling you all this is because watch what I end up trying to do, and let me know if you agree with it or not.
So it looks like I'm hitting the four ball. So I must be trying to pocket the one. And you see what I did to the eight? The eight ball is now makeable into the side pocket. Now, what I don't remember is if I finish the rack or not. So top left spin there. But I didn't I didn't get the position uh that I was looking for. I do remember this spot here. This is a very creative shot. Let me know let me know what y'all think of uh this shot that I that I attempt to come up with. Ah, uh, Zach Smith, we do that in BCA where you shoot a ball and call a safety at the same time. That's in BCA. In APA, you can't do that. Now, look at this shot that I try to do here. Watch that four ball because this is all intentional. Looks like I have draw on the cue ball. You see what the four ball did? Let's look at it one more time. I played that four ball into the nine ball and then knew that the natural angle of how it's going to come off of the nine will hopefully bank its way back over to the cor over to the uh, corner pocket. And had I'd made it, I got position on the two, and then I would uh, get the um, uh, eight ball to go into the uh, side pocket. Kyle Kerr, there you have it. Bank bank it off the nine. That's exactly what I'm talking about. What's going on, uh, Bank Time Pool? How you doing, man? But I freaking missed. So what difference does it make? Um. Let's see. Actually, we're actually we're on one inning uh, because my opponent scratched. So now my opponent's back at the table. Takes his 15 ball to go into the side pocket. Opponent's got a fairly wide open table here. It just has to have a good cue ball control. Pattern, um, pattern is important too. You know, like I said, wants to try to come up with a a relatively easy pattern. Oh, but look at that. Look at that. Very smart, right? You know, we we, we can maybe call it a confidence confidence issue or maybe just straight up strategy. Straight up strategy, right? Not entirely sure what the what the rest of the pattern possibly could have been because I'm sure there's one out there, but he uh, my opponent opts to play a safety. All right, so I can't see my two ball, can't see my four ball. You can see that I'm uh, pretty much going to be kicking the cue ball into the rail. I'm trying to go for that four ball um, on this shot here. Uh, nothing but a, I think, pretty much a rolling cue ball. Looking for the natural angle that's going to take me over there. And look at that. I at least didn't foul. I had, I had a, uh, hitting both of my balls. Now, I was at least fortunate that I kind of tied up uh, my opponent's 12 ball. All right, so I might get a shot back at the table. Um, had had I not covered up that that 12 ball, then uh, you know my my opponent's in a very good position to maybe try to clear the table. But let's see what happens. Okay, nine ball into the corner pocket, nice little rolling cue ball there. Uh, I can see that the 11 ball should go into the side pocket. Uh, but it looks like he's taking the 10 instead. Does it squeeze past the two? It does. Nicely done. So now I have to wonder, what is my opponent going to do with this 12 ball? Because th this would almost be a point to where he may want to try to finish the table unless he wants me to figure out what I'm, what I'm going to do with my two ball. Hmm. You can see he's starting to shake his head. He's starting to wonder. Takes another ball off the table. Ooh, does he have an angle where he can play the 13 and then maybe get the cue ball to come over here and spin into the spin into the two ball? Oh, that must have been what he was trying. I mean, wrong spin on the cue ball, though. Cue ball coming back this way. Now what? 
maybe cross bank the 12 ball um, and see if the and see if my four ball will help. I, I think that's what he's looking at. Let's see. Oh, I think that's what he was trying. That was really what, and he wanted. I, I'm pretty sure he wanted to catch the side or the short rail, and then have the uh, have his ball car, uh, carom off of my four ball. I'm pretty sure that everything he just tried to do was intentional. He just ended up hitting the short rail too soon. Now I think I probably wanted to be a little bit more straighter to shoot the two ball here into the uh, the corner pocket, uh, but I think I end up with just a uh, um, a thinner cut shot than I wanted. The cue ball just kind of floats its way on down there, or two ball floats its way down there, barely uh, rocks its way in. But then remember when I bumped the eight ball into this position, so I at least have that shot. There we go, and I'm up two to zero. Yeah, Zach Smith, that like. There are cases where that is a good choice. You said you would have purposely missed the nine and left it out on the table and make me break out my two, right? So but you have to take that a step further, right? Remember, because I have my four ball sitting in that corner pocket. So you want to make sure that you give me a shot on my four ball to where it is really difficult for me to break out my two ball, right? Because Against other types of, of, of uh, opponents, that would be more ideal to where you don't have to be as concerning. There we go. Look at that. See how the cue ball, see how the cue ball comes back and then tries to fight its way back forward? That's what that little bit of topspin uh, does for you. Uh, hold on a second. I want to see what this is now. Now you're saying, what about a power draw on the two in the corner? Bring the cue ball um, into the eight to bump it into the open. Let's go back and look. So right now I can see the timestamp of where I'm at. Let's go back and look. Uh, where exactly are we talking about? Are you talking about when I had ball in hand? So right here. This is when I had ball in hand. The eight would probably lay close to the side pocket. You would still have three insurance balls. I'm assuming you're talking about right here when I had ball in hand. Play the two ball into the corner pocket and then try to power draw back into the eight uh, like you're talking about. If this is what you're talking about, it's an option. I'm not going to disagree with that. I just kind of don't like the idea of power drawing the cue ball. Whereas in when you look at the option that I took, which was giving myself a little angle on the four ball, that natural tangent line is just easier to control. Much, 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 much easier to control than for me to try to accurately use the correct amount of power to draw the cue ball off of the two, bump the eight ball appropriately to where it still lands in the same spot. Uh, for me for for me to be able to go into the side pocket. Is it possible? Yes, it's absolutely possible. But I personally would think that it's harder to do that than what I did. Now, I'm not suggesting that what I did was the best decision, but I think between what I tried to do and what you're suggesting, I would have to say that mine would probably be easier to execute, but your suggestion is something that can be done as well. So I hope that makes sense. Now, let's go back to where I last left off. It should be right about here. I think I I think all I did was did I did I break dry? What did I do? Nice little halting cue ball. And yes, I broke dry. So, oh, a little bit of an open table here. Let's see what my opponent decides to do. Yeah, 
yeah, coders for life. I can't I can't disagree with that. Instead, if any of the balls were were uh, clustered up, you probably would have not left the the eight ball near the side pocket. Um, you would have just adjusted uh, the 13 shot in the side uh, to touch the eight ball and move it away. I mean, that, that's certainly an option if you're if you're stripes. Uh, but in my case, being solids, uh, that that's why that's why it's, if if I were stripes uh, in that in that rack there, I I, w I would agree with that statement. Okay, two for two for one. My my opponent's an overachiever, so he stripes. I'm gonna be solids. I'm pretty sure he probably did not want that 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 first stripe to fall. Back to back combos, but now I get to come to the table. Honestly, don't even know if I have the inning count uh, correct anymore. <laughs> So I'm solid. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Uh, you see the same routine as I sit there and just look at every ball and try to figure out what in the world I'm going to do. I don't even think I have an opening shot. I don't have an opening shot. All right. I see I have top spin. What the heck am I doing? I'm aiming at the six ball, I think. Or am I cutting the seven? Oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> okay. So I pocket the six ball uh, in this corner pocket. Looks like I have shape on the seven. I might be able to cut the seven into uh, this corner pocket here. May maybe bank it. Actually, you know what? No, I, I'm, I'm going to bank it because of, because of all this garbage up here. If I cut the ball in then my cue ball is going to run into the 13 ball and I've got nothing. So I, I have to imagine that I'm going to be banking this ball in into, into this pocket here. If I bank the ball in, cue ball should come over here and then uh, start heading towards this clutter. So I probably have a hint of right spin um, on the cue ball. Oh, whoa, never mind. That was some bottom right um, on the cue ball. Looks like that's the one ball I'm playing into the um, bottom corner pocket there. Nice little stop shot there. Okay, wh <laughs> what in the world's going through my mind? What am I gonna do with the five, and what am I gonna do with the three? Let's see. What do I do here? Okay, broke the three out with some uh, top spin. Oh, okay. I I remember uh, what I'm gonna do here. This shot here, I tried to play this with just the right amount of bottom left spin. You see what I did there? I'm trying to size up the three ball because I want to play the three into the corner off of my opponent's stripe so I can hopefully free out my solid. The only problem is when I start coming back here, I got to worry about this corner pocket here. Right? Look at that. What I don't want to happen because if I can get it to land right where I need to be, I can hopefully break my five out, maybe win the rack. But I goofed. Okay, opponent starts with his 10 ball. Can't really tell if this combo is wired uh, to where he can uh, make this stripe here. Let's see what he does. Gently plays the nine ball. Okay. Okay, nice little stun shot there. I'm guessing this combo goes. 
The only thing my opponent has to worry about is where does his ball go after it hits my five. Nicely done. Oh. Let's see here. What's he going to do here? What can he do here? Okay, elevated on the queue. Ooh, banks it into the side pocket, but wait a minute. Now, the shot was awesome, but what about the cue ball? What do y'all what do y'all think? What would I mean I, nobody's watching the shot, right? So if no one watches the shot, it's it's the shooter's call, but should the cue ball be be able to do that? With the way he with the way he elevated on on uh the way he elevated on that? Now, like I said, it doesn't matter because no one was watching the shot, so it's it's up to the shooter on whether or not. It's like I said, the bank in the side pocket was freaking awesome, but I just I think that might have been a foul. Oh, and he ends up overcutting the eight ball. Leaving me an open shot on my final solid. Let's see. What do I got? Bottom spin on the cue ball. Maybe a touch of left. And then eight ball in the corner pocket. Only another stop shot. There we go. Yeah, so th those are always like some tricky situations on whether or not if something's going to be a foul or not. And usually I try to rely on physics uh, to to be able to explain whether or not. Like I, I would probably have to think that that was a foul. He was elevated on the cue ball. So therefore he's trying to draw the cue ball back. So to see the cue ball propel forward makes me suspect that that might that might have been a double hit um on the cue ball because then you, when you think about it the cue ball and the object ball are the, are of the same mass so the cue ball cannot occupy the same space um as the object ball unless he unless he jumped the cue ball into the object ball i i would probably i would probably believe it then but he, he, his body's in front of the cue ball so i'm i'm not i'm not i'm not entirely sure I saw that I made a solid on that break, and look where my cue ball ends up, surrounded by stripes. And actually, I think I don't even I don't even know if I have the inning uh, count correct. So I'm solids. What the heck am I doing? I'm I'm already blocking everything. What am I doing? Oh, I must have tried to billiard the cue ball off my six into my opponent's stripe and to see if the stripe would have knocked my seven ball in. Like, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that's what I was trying to do. So, my opponent gets to come to the table now. Uh, they're right here, I at least like that my opponent case, you know, observes the entire table before he makes his decision because he should have already identified that this is this is going to be an issue for him. So let's see how he tries to deal with it. Okay, nice little stop shot there. Oh. 
Oh, that was awesome. I like that he tried to break out his nine ball. It's just unfortunate that he did not do it. And it doesn't look like he left himself much of a shot um, either. So, bit unfortunate there. Let's see what he does. Is, is this going to be a safety? Yeah, a little bit of a a little bit of a safety there. But it looks like the the table's pretty open for me. My only ball it looks like I might be concerned about is my six ball. Let's see what I do here. Starting with the four, looks like I might just be doing a stop shot so I can play the three next maybe. Oh no, I do draw back. The heck did I do that for? All right. I must have been drawing back to get position on the seven. And then from the seven, try to get position on the six. But since I got hooked, I came back down and shot the three ball. Because if, if, my, if my next ball was going to be the three ball, there was no reason for me to draw the cue ball back the way that I did. So I'm pretty sure that's that's probably what I had in mind there. Because now from here, I would have to think that if I try to draw back off the five ball, I can have some sort of position on the six to go into the opposite corner pocket. You can see I've got bottom spin on the cue ball. I do draw it back slightly. I probably wanted to draw back a little bit more. It looks like I'm elevated on the cue. Yeah, little Q, uh, little Q elevation. So I must be trying to stun right off the six, maybe get the cue ball to travel down the tangent line because this looks like a back cut. Yeah, a little bit of a, yeah, pretty much a stun shot. Seven ball, corner pocket. Probably with a little bit of top right spin as I get the cue ball to come back down towards the middle of the table and be able to shoot the eight ball into the opposite corner pocket or hug the rail um, and then shoot the eight ball into the uh, opposite corner pocket. Like a little bit of a rolling cue ball there. There we go. And I'm on the hill. Okay, so we got a couple of y'all that think that 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 might have been, but that might have been a foul, and I, I would probably have to agree. But again, at the same time, according to the APA rules, when we have close shots like that, you have to call someone else to come and watch and make a judgment call on it. Because if you don't, then it's up to the shooter uh, to decide whether or not if they fouled or not. And I know the the double hit foul is one of the more is the most controversial shot uh, um, called um, in, in the game. Oh, so this is my eight ball break attempt. Look at that eight ball moving. Looks like I made a two, four, six. I made a stripe and two, four. I made a solid and a stripe. So I have an open table. But it looks like my best opening shot is solids. Five ball in the side pocket. Looks like a little bit of bottom spin. Oh, wiped its feet on the way in there. Drew back looks like for the four ball. I can't see what I'm putting on the cue ball here. So let's let's watch and see what happens. So that looked like probably a rolling cue ball with just a hint of left spin as I get positioned on the seven. Can't really see what I'm doing here. It looks like I might be having bottom spin on this one too. Yep, just a little bit of bottom spin. Got position for the two, it looks like. What am I trying to do here? Okay, stop the cue ball. Looks like for a position on the three to go into the side pocket. Like I have bottom spin on this one. Do I draw back for the six? Slight draw back for the six. Six should go into the, the corner pocket. Looks like I have a little bit of draw and just a hint of left spin. Come off the side rail. 
And as long as I don't get hooked, eight ball in the corner pocket. Do I end up uh, breaking and running? Uh, what? I broke and ran uh, the first rack, and I break and run to win the set. Yes, started the set off with a break and run, and then ending the set with a break and run, winning five to zero. So, I think in this matchup here, like I, I don't really see anything wrong with what my opponent was doing. He played safeties when he thought safeties were uh, were appropriate, um, and I think most of his pattern selection uh, was pretty good. But like I said, if you're making good choices then the only thing you can fault yourself for is when your execution really isn't there um, on that. And so like when you're, when you're just making natural mistakes like that, I mean, stuff like stuff like that's going to happen. So I think my opponent played good. Just I played better. I, you know, th that's what I was saying. Like when you, when you, when you're playing good and you still lose, that just means you're getting outplayed by the opponent. And that's supposed to be okay. Now, I'm pretty sure my opponent doesn't want to lose five to zero, or uh, uh, but against that, but judging by watching how my opponent was trying to pick apart the rack, playing safes where appropriate and stuff, I think my opponent just did really well. It's just unfortunate that on the shots that he missed, or I think there was a couple of shots where he um um he gave me he gave me cue ball in hand. You know that's that's just where he uh, that's just where he fell short. But that's the name of the game, and that's how we learn. We take these mistakes, we try to figure out how to correct the mistakes, and then have better games uh, for next time. So, what do we think, folks? Out of all of that, like, um, I guess I would add, how about, of, of all three opponents, which one, uh, which, like, how would you, how would you rank, uh, their performance from you know one two and three um because this is this is not a matter of i, I don't want to hear anything about like you know how are they the skill level at which they're at that's that's not what we're talking about because again everybody is at the skill level at which they're at according to the apa uh, uh scale and the, we don't have control of that we we could talk about the apa scale all day all or whatever what all, all i'm really interested in and knowing is if i wasn't their opponent and all the all the judgments uh, or all the advices that I was giving to each one of them, I I I I beat all of them five to zero, right? But which ones would you say performed better than the other? Like how how would you how would you rank them? How would you rank them? Uh, Dylan Young, you're wanting to know why do I hit the eight ball uh so hard? You'd have you'd have to watch uh, more of, of of my play, but on I think on the on that particular shot there, it's it's not that I'm really hitting the the ball hard. Um, it's just that my cue ball doesn't move, right? So if you, because anybody that knows me knows that I typically do not um, hit the ball hard, um, but it, it all it all depends on the the type of shot uh, that I would have to take, but. If I remember correctly, on that last eight ball shot, my my cue ball doesn't move. So I basically did it like a stop shot or a stun shot, and those are those shots are basically hit harder than than you would lag to ensure that the cue ball is not going is not going to move. Um, it basically just halts right on contact, so I don't have to worry about scratching or anything like that. <clears throat> Hey, it looks like we got a looks like we got a pretty good consensus that the 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 fi my my final opponent um played quote unquote uh the best. Uh Valdemar Peña, you're wanting to know um a little bit more of where in Texas um I I play in? Well, I always like to say that I play in the central Texas um area. Um anybody that that knows me um, or that it, that has that has followed me enough. Um, I don't really like to disclose precisely um, where I'm at. Not not so much that I'm going to give you my address or anything, but I don't really even like to uh, give the city out. Um, 
not because of like I think I'm like hot stuff or whatever and or or anything like that. It it comes from me when I used to work for the Department of Defense. Um and I you know I used to have a top secret security clearance um and stuff as a, as a software developer and I just have a much higher appreciation of having certain private information remain private. Now having said that, it doesn't take much effort to really locate where I'm at. Um, it's just that you're not going to get it directly from me, if 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 that makes sense. <clears throat> now, what did y'all think? Because this pretty much wraps up the stream. Um, you know, I can sit here and uh, maybe have maybe talk for about another 10 or 15 minutes because um, I've been streaming now for three hours and, and, and 15 minutes and it's getting late. <laughs> it's a it's 11 15 uh, p.m. Uh, where I'm at. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to just uh, just continuously talk, 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 though I could, uh, depending upon if uh, if questions uh, roll in um, and, and whatnot. Uh, but I actually miss uh, doing this like i said it's been two months uh since the last time i reviewed um my apa matches and now that i'm done with the uh summer session let me check and see how many matches i have for the fall for you uh, for all of y'all <laughs> i've only got i've only got four i've only got four matches so i don't know de depending upon how long um each of those matches are um, I can probably do all four of them uh, in one live stream. Maybe do two for two. Um, not not entirely sure at it because I'd have to go back and and look and see um, how long uh, each each of those matches are. <clears throat> ah, uh, Matt three hundred three. You're saying you struggle against uh, lower skill level players, and do I play different uh, when you're up against the skill level two or three? I don't. Uh, it depends. I guess it depends on what you say by different. Because I already talked about this earlier to where like you should be playing everybody the same exact way. Um, and that is basically play as if your opponent is better than you. Because when you say you struggle against lower skill level players, what does that mean? Does that mean you play really aggressive? And because you, you just have this notion that because they're a lower skill level player that you'll end up coming back to the table anyway? And do you end up finding yourself in positions to where, like, you ran the table and then every time that lower skill level player misses, you have to do some sort of kick shot because you're hooked or 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 whatever? Like, are those type of situations you end up uh, you end up running into? Because that's why, if that is the case, that is why that I advise that you don't play laxed against lower skill level players. You play against lower skill level players as if they were higher skillable players because just, if like i said when you whenever you find yourself in situations to where you've ran the table but you didn't finish the table now you're in catch-up mode because if you're playing against a good player they're just going to out strategize you and make a ball here and there uh, play a play a defensive shot get ball in hand and then just run the table but if you're playing against a lower skillable player they're going to get lucky and hook you and then you end up having to kick, and if you're on the eight ball, you end up trying to kick at it, and you miss, and you scratch, and they end up winning a game, you know, stuff like that. That's why you don't want to do stuff like that. You got you got to still be able to play them smart. So you play skill level twos and skill level threes as if they're skill level sevens. Strategically, get your table ready to where you know you're going to finish the table. Like the you've calculated the percentage of you being successful is like 90 plus percent. Because if it's not, then just just be a little careful. At, at um at trying to uh uh just run balls because you're saying to yourself like well i'm gonna get back to the table so i'm gonna be fine like that's that's not a mentality that you should have because that's just open uh that just leaves a huge opening for like bad habits to creep their way in and then just bad strategy <clears throat> yeah zach smith you're saying you know play the table don't really look at who you're playing and, and what the handicap is. That, that that that's probably just that's an easier summarized way of uh, <laughs> explaining uh, what I what I just said. Uh, Captain or Captain As, uh, you're saying I used to be this way against lower players. Uh, best thing is to play even more safes against them and leave them harder shots. Play the game where you get the advantage. Exactly. Play the game where you always have the advantage 
no matter what your skill level, um, what what uh, skill level your opponent is. That is that is really like a really good way of uh, explaining it. Because as I said before, if you run the table and don't finish because you knew you weren't going to finish, not because you, and you don't finish, not because you missed. I'm talking about because you end up running into a troubled ball that you didn't deal with early, early enough, so you just end up trying to arbitrarily open it up and it's like, well, I'm going to get back to the table. Well, when you do that, you're waiting for your opponent to make the crucial mistake that will allow you to shoot your last ball or have a shot at the eight ball, which means you are not in control of the rack. So if you happen to win the rack, then really you won the rack by luck not because you were in control. So that's why I always suggest or always advise play the game where you're in control and always try to have control when you're on the table and even when you're off the table. And how do you have control when you're off the table? Well, that's what the that's what your defensive that's what your defensive game um is for. Always try to be in control of the game. And win and win under controlling conditions, not because of lucky conditions. Lucky conditions are going to pop up every now and again. Right, they're 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 not complete they're not completely avoidable. Lucky conditions are going to happen, uh, but always try to be in as much control as you possibly can. <laughs> Coders for life, I know what you mean by that. The point where the team throws throws off on you, they throw a lower skill level player, hoping that you'll like you know like I've played against skill level twos before, so it's a race to seven two to me. So like it's easy and I've had this happen before too to where like um like I'm a victim of my own advice to where like I just run the table or whatever and the next thing you know I'm on the eight ball and I end up knocking it in the wrong pocket or I end up scratching on the eight. And my opponent's on the hill. So now they they've 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 won a point for their team. Right? That that's basic that that is it that is a thing. That is a strategy that uh usually uh happens in APA where um you sacrifice a lower skill level player up against a higher skill level player with the uh with the um and gamble that they're going that the higher skill level player is going to make a mistake and allow uh, the lower skill level to win a rack by default because of a foul or you know eight ball wrong pocket eight ball early you know whatever and they end up at least scoring a point or possibly winning because of that as well. Like I said, all the more reason why just just play the same no matter what no matter what your opponent is. <laughs> Corner for billiards says, so you think playing a skill level three in eight ball as a skill level seven sucks? Try playing a skill level two in nine ball as a skill level eight. I'll I'll one up you, uh, Corner for billiards. Try as a skill level nine because I've I've had I've had that happen uh, to me as well. That's not fun at all when I've got to go to 75 points and they've got to go to like 14 or 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 what or whatever it is. That is tough. But I know exactly what you're talking about there. Yeah, I like I like the way you're putting that, uh, uh, Captain. Which is like you know, is it you, you certainly want to make sure that you stay in control of your emotions when you're playing, especially when you're playing up against a lower skillable player, because it's very easy for them to get lucky on you. You get frustrated, and then your game just goes to crap uh, after that. One analogy that I always like to explain to my players is the snowball analogy, right? You just you just don't want your snowball to get out of control. Because no matter what, in every game that you ever play, in every match that you ever play, the snowball is always, always going to get created in your match. It could be you missing a, a shot. It could be your opponent getting lucky. Whatever happens... The, the snowball mentality gets created. It is completely up to you to keep that snowball as small as possible. Because once, you're, once your mental game is gone and you're just either super frustrated, super ticked off or whatever, your game just goes completely downhill uh, from there. <laughs> I can only imagine what it's like playing up against the skillable one. I think in my area, I think we, because like I don't play nine ball anymore because as a skill level nine, it's just hard for me to play on a roster. I have played 
nine ball, um, APA nine ball. I have a couple of matches, APA matches, uh, of me playing uh, nine ball. Um, and I think we have like one or two skill level ones um, in the area. I just haven't had the pleasure of playing them yet. Uh, but if, if I remember correctly, I think a skill level two goes to 14, I think. Um, let me see, APA equalizer. Oh, never mind. Skill level 1 goes to 14. Skill level 2 goes to 19. I've played up against skill level 2s before in 9-ball. I've never played up against a skill level 1. So I can only imagine this 14, but that's two racks. That's two freaking racks that, that a, a skill level 1 uh, can, can, can actually win. So like that, that, that's, that's got to be like super tough. <clears throat> Oh, man. But that's what makes... Uh, I know I know APA gets a, a really big uh, bad rap. Um, has a bad reputation um, with regards to, um, you know, people that sandbag or people aren't accurately um, placed at the, at the skill level. Like, people that are skill level fives that truly believe that they should be a skill level four or... You know, just just whatever um, in general, and then of course uh, the the um, like the stuff that you see at nationals, um, just the the controversies that you might end up at nationals where you think um, you know people that win uh, probably should have been disqualified because they they managed to beat the system or whatever. Like as far as I'm concerned, stuff like that that that's People, like, I, I just can't say that that's the APA's fault. The only thing I could possibly fault the APA for is if, they, if they're they willing to admit that that's a problem, that they're aware of it, but they haven't done anything to fix it. Now, I know at least when you get to the national level, if you actually, because uh, I, I think it happened this year, I think two teams got disqualified um, at the APA 8-ball uh, national event uh, that I went to because te some, like, teammates on those teams jumped up two levels. Um, I think I remember reading a, um, a post um, on Facebook where uh, a team captain basically uh, rant and raved um, about his team getting disqualified uh, be, uh, because of that. You know, st stuff, stuff like that, like, I don't know. I don't know how else to, to, to say it. It's like, if you honestly feel that you have to sandbag to get to APA Nationals for a shot at winning Ten thousand, twenty-five thousand, or, or whatever. Instead of just playing to your heart's content, getting better, representing the skill level at which you're supposed to represent, then I don't know what else to say to that. Like, I don't ever advise any of my uh, players to do that. My my players always play to their heart's content, and that's why um, when I went to nationals, I wasn't able to play. Because with all the COVID delays and everything else, like everybody's skill levels had climbed another level or two to the point to where we couldn't even make a roster around me as a skill level seven with my eight ball team, right? So we always just play, 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 play. And then we just deal with whatever uh, we have to deal with. Um, but I don't know. It, it, it It's it's a hard subject, um, I think, to talk about. Um, I kind of wish that... Um, Stuff like that would be handled more at the local level, um, instead of at the at the national level. Because if 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 sandbagging uh, was ha was gotten away with at the local level, then basically anybody that got beat at the local level was was just not given a fair shake uh, to be able to you know have their shot at regionals or nationals or or anything like that. So it's just like. You know, people are going to do whatever they're, whatever they're going to do. And, and so, like, I don't know how much responsibility that you would really want to put on APA itself other than they should crack down a little bit harder um, on their rules and try to, and try to um, fix sandbaggers from getting to the national event rather than disqualifying them at the national event once they've been exposed, if, if that makes sense. Um, I know... APA 8-Ball gets a bad rap because people don't like the idea that you have to play what you make unless you happen to make one of each. Um, 
I understand the argument. I mean, I truly do. It's like, you know, there there are plenty of times to where, like, you know, if you make a solid on the break and you're playing BCA and you end up choosing stripes because stripes is just easier to run and therefore you get the win. I mean, I totally get that. That's a thing. I was like, but since if you make a solid on the break and solids is harder to run than stripes, we always like to talk about, like, we want to see how good people are we want to see their skill right so isn't it wouldn't it be more impressive to see a player run out a set that was actually harder because they made that set on the break like the argument i i'm not going to argue that it goes both ways because like if you want to win you want to win so therefore you want to take the easier the easier route out so when you if it's always open at the after the break, regardless if you if you make a solid or stripe, then you know you want to take the the path of least resistant and come out with the victory. I mean, I totally get that. But then when you're forced to do something because it's just part of the rules and it requires more skill to do it, and you do it, isn't that just more impressive? Like, I don't know. That's that, that's just kind of like my uh, uh, opinion on that. Uh, Coders for Life, I do believe um, that the, the league operators uh, do um, take some sort of uh, consequence um, if, if, a, if a sandbagger uh, makes its way to nationals um, or if, if uh, a player or team like, gets into a fight. Um, uh, a physical altercation at the national level. I think like some, some of that backlash I think does uh, fall back um on the um on the league operator but like for example i think i think this year there was a eight ball team out of san, san antonio texas my home state uh that won the eight ball team event and there was a bit of controversy uh behind that team or, or no it wasn't the eight ball event i'm sorry i think it was the nine ball event they won the uh, apa nine ball event and there was a match where two skill level fives were going against one another. And the, um, the, the, the gentleman that played from San Antonio won his match 20 to zero. He scored 20 to zero. Um, he shut out his opponent. I think I, um, his opponent was a female. I think she made a couple of points, but not enough points to where she was able to lose like 19 to one. She ended up getting 20 owed. Now, when I watched the match, it wasn't like the greatest of match. It's not like the guy like super controlled the table and you know stuff like that. And I was like, but when I looked up his name in Fargo, he has an unestablished Fargo rating of like 650 something. Unestablished meaning he does not have 200 games, 200 plus games in the system. I'm a 642. And a skill level nine. And here you have an unestablished 650 as a skill level five. Like you can you can argue that well it's unestablished, so maybe he, he beat a couple of people in his area and and he's at where he's at, but then after he gets two hundred games in, he'll drop down into the five hundreds or whatever. Like I don't know. It's it's just kind of hard to tell. But you know the, the the thing is is that the 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 national event is over. The 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 teams were awarded, money was already paid out, so it's too late. So even if it even if it's true, it's too late. It's done and over with, right? But if it is true, this is really what basically gives APA a bad rap, right? But not because of APA, but because people that that learn how to how to defeat that little loophole. Um, in the system, where where I would be, where I would basically argue, well, people shouldn't do that, but people are, so it it is what it is. <clears throat> yeah, corner for billiards. It is hard to catch uh, sandbagging. Um, 
I wouldn't necessarily say because un unless the division rep um, actually watches a few matches of the player in question, um, because like for example, the like the judgment of sandbagging um, is 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 subjective, right? How many of y'all have ever looked at a player, a lower skill level player, and you go, that's not they're not the skill level at which they represent. Like they're too low to be a three or they're too low to be a four or whatever. And, but the only reason why you're doing that though, is because you observe one game or two game, a couple of games and, and they're playing phenomenally uh, on that, on that particular night. Right. It's just, and, and this, this is one argument that I do happen to agree with, uh, with the APA is that they say, you know, you can't judge a person's skill level off of like, you know, one or two matches. Um, I do happen to agree with that to an extent. Not to its entirety, uh, but to it to an extent, because what I look for, if I want to know about someone's skill level, is I watch their cue ball. I watch their cue ball, and I watch their and I watch their pre-shot routine. Uh, meaning that if I if I'm watching that cue ball, and they're like controlling that cue ball as a skill level three or a skill level four, then my red flags are going to start going off. Like, cause I'm not saying skill level threes and skill level fours can't control a cue ball, um, because every every now and again you can. But if you watched a skill level three or four control a cue ball like a skill level five or six would, then it's like, yeah, uh, you watch the you watch their pre shot routine and 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 see how smooth their stroke. Like, there are a lot of telltale signs that you can look at. But if there's a smart person that knows all of that, they can make themselves look like a, a complete bungling idiot uh, while they're playing, but then every now and again just try to let out that that particular shot. Because like I've got players on my team that are skill level fours that don't use top spin, bottom spin, left spin, or right spin. They're just center ball hit players. They just allow that cue ball to just roll across the table. And they can they can play some pretty good runs. Three ball runs, four ball runs, sometimes five ball runs, just allowing the cue ball to just roll, roll, roll. Which means that my players are just natural shot makers, right? And that's a hard thing to to really assess on whether or not if they're supposed to be at the skill level at which they're at. Because I do claim that if you're just a shot maker, that that's only going to take you so far, right? There's going to be a point in time where you kind of need to control the cue ball in order to be able to finish the table. Not always. Sometimes you can take a particular pattern layout and just use center ball and just shoot, 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 and you'll be just fine. But more times than not, you're going to have to use bottom spin, top spin, a little bit of left, a little bit of right, whatever, uh, to, to, be able to, uh, to be able to finish the table. So that's, that's the hard part that I, that I always uh, see with um, trying to identify someone that's you know, not representing the skill level at which they are supposed to be at. Uh, but then there's the then there's the flip side of it to where like sometimes I know that um, certain players uh, can get boosted up uh, sooner than sooner than I think that they should. Um, and then once they're boosted up, it's like almost impossible for them to come back down. So it's like it forces them to um, to to try to get better and to try to be better. And then that's what's the that's what the biggest thing that I think the APA gets a bad rap for is because uh, they. They basically get it to the point to where, uh, like, team players, uh, teammates go up so high to where the team has to split apart, which means you have to bring in more people. More people brought into the APA system means more money into the APA system, so that way the business makes more money. Blah 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 blah. Right? We, we all we all know and understand that that's a thing. Uh, and I can't I can't fault a business for for doing that. I mean that's smart business, right? But it's as long it's smart business as long as the raising of skill level uh, the raising of uh, player skill levels is not malicious just for the sake of bringing in more money i mean like if it's if it's legit then like that's like i i just think of that as smart business and it, and it, and it's and it's supposed to be a thing There's a player in my Valley League that plays like that, and he makes a lot of balls on a consistent basis. And you must be talking about just just using center ball. Like that's a thing. Like you know, you like you don't have to control the cue ball. You can just let it roll. Uh, but I, I I truly believe that that that's only gonna take you so far. 
um, and you eventually have to start to learn uh, to control the cue ball. Let's see here. I think everything's kind of uh, slowing itself down. I don't really see any questions. I've been streaming for three hours and roughly 40 minutes. I think I'm pretty much going to call it a night. Uh, Benjamin Gottlieb, you said you use uh, English, you use top spin, bottom spin, left spin, right spin, but you're inconsistent at making the shots. You can run four or five straight sometimes, but not often, and you're a four. So since you're a four, my advice uh, to you would be is since you're since you're inconsistent when you're using side spin, how consistent are you when you're not using side spin? Like I'm like I have no issue with using top spin and bottom spin because all you're doing is affecting the all you're doing is affecting the tangent line off of the object ball when you do that. Um, but like the way I usually advise my teammates, uh, especially those that are learning, like my one of my fours that I'm talking about that just a straight center ball player, she um, only uses side spin when I have her do a timeout, um, and 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 like side spin is necessary or top spin or whatever, um, because every one of my players first learn where the cue ball goes. All by itself, which is the rolling cue ball, center ball hit, maybe a little bit of top spin um, to create that that rolling cue ball effect, uh, so that way they can learn where does the cue ball go all by itself. Um, because then you you take that information um, and know that do you have to hit the cue ball a little bit harder just to have it travel a little bit farther? Do you have to hit it a little bit softer so it doesn't travel um, as far? Um, do you, do you obviously avoid scratching and stuff like that? Because if you do not know where that cue ball goes all by itself, how could you possibly know where it's going to go if you try to control it? And that's that's usually the way um, I try to advise players, especially players that want to try to use side spin. Um, because depending upon if you're a front hand English player or a backhand English player, like you almost have no business using side spin if you don't even know where the cue ball goes by itself. And so that would be if if you're if you're saying that you're a skill level four that would probably be my advice to where like try to use side spin a little less at this point in time in your game i like i said perfectly fine with you using top spin and bottom spin because like i said all you're doing is, is affecting the tangent line but if you can see that the way the cue ball is naturally going to roll all by itself will get you where you need to go then there's obviously no need for a side spin but then you're really going to start noticing at some point in time where side spin is going to help. And that's when you start trying to incorporate it in um, and, and use it when necessary. So if you're not real consistent without using side spin either, again, um, if you were here earlier, I would have to wonder, are you just not aiming correctly or is your stroke not straight? Right? Because if you're not using side spin, then hopefully you're sending the cue ball in a straight line um, at your target. And so if you're missing, if you're missing your target, meaning that you're missing the shot, not missing the target, as in you just completely miss the ball, uh, but you don't make the shot that you're trying to make, um, are you not aiming correctly, or is your straight, pff, is your straight, is your stroke not straight enough to where you might accidentally twitch, you might accidentally throw a little side spin on the cue ball, and your cue ball deflects, you know, blah blah blah. If you can. Work all that out to where you know your stroke. <laughs> I can't even talk. Like that's how that's how tired I am now, and my my vocal cords are giving out. If you can be certain that your stroke is straight, and you're not twitching, you're not accidentally applying side spin, then you can say that your your aim is not correct, and you still need to correct that before you even attempt to put side spin um, on the cue ball. And you're and you're willing to admit that you think your uh, your stroke is not straight. You need you need to fix that. You need to know that the reason why you miss a shot is because you're not aiming correctly, not because of some flaw in your fundamentals. Eliminate any possible flaws in your fundamentals, then start to learn that you're you know whatever you're. Think about it like this. Anybody should understand what I'm about to say here. 
whenever you shoot your shot, no matter what, you're looking down the you're looking down your cue through the cue ball at the object ball. At some point in time, your brain's gonna go, "This is right, shoot," and you shoot the ball. Right when you hit that cue ball, you're about to find out real quick: were you right or were you wrong? Right, because no matter what, anytime you pull the trigger and try and try to shoot a shot, your brain says this all looks good and the end result will either validate you or invalidate you so every time you miss the shot remember you thought you were right but you end up finding out you were wrong and then that's when you really need to find out why you were wrong and if you can eliminate that you were wrong or if you can eliminate that none of your fundamentals were the reason why you were wrong then what you're processing when you see is what you have to fix no matter what no matter what i hope i hope what i'm saying um is making sense here because you're going to sit there think about it like this how many times have you tried to sh put the cue ball and the object ball in a straight line shoot the ball into the pocket and get the cue ball to follow straight after the object ball because when you shoot it and you and you make the object ball and the cue ball follows in but it kind of drifts off to one side it still scratches but it drifts off to one side or the other well if it drifts off to one side or the other that means you did not hit it absolutely straight your eyes think you're hitting it straight that's what my three in one straight in drill will expose to you if you try my three in one straight in drill that's on my YouTube channel and, and try to do the conditions at which I set to where like when you're practicing your follow shots, your objective is to have the cue ball follow after the object ball and scratch in a complete straight line. Because if it goes off to one side or the other, you're cheating the pocket. And you're not supposed to, in the drill, you're not supposed to cheat the pocket. You're supposed to hit it as straight as you possibly can. Same thing when you do a stop shot. If you stop the cue ball, the cue ball should not rock to one side or the other because if it does you're not hitting as straight as you possibly can and that's the that's the exact reason what I'm talking about that when whenever you shoot a shot the moment you pull the trigger your eyes and your brain saying this is right you shoot the shot and you miss and you go what the heck well like i said if every part of your fundamentals was 100% accurate then for whatever reason Whatever you processed through your eyes is not correct. And you have to figure out how to fix that. That and that, there's, there is nothing I can say. There's no type of advice. No, this is what I always tell my, my teammates. I cannot help you fix your aim because I cannot see what you see. All you can do is take the information of the end result and realize this. Whatever the heck you were looking at that you thought was right, you have to remember that picture because when you, if you set up the same shot, if you were to take reinforcement la uh, labels, put them onto the table, put the cue ball and the object ball on those reinforcement labels, shoot the shot. Before you shoot the shot, you see this picture. You think this picture is correct. You shoot and you miss. Like I said, all your fundamentals are good and you thought you were right. So when you when you put the the cue ball and the object ball back down on the on those reinforcement labels and you create that same picture, well you should know that if you shoot that same exact picture, you're going to miss. And you have to create a whole new picture to see if you're going to get a completely different result and hopefully it's the result that you're looking for. That is always the best aiming advice that I can ever possibly give because an aiming system isn't going to do jack diddly crap for you. Aiming systems get you into the ballpark. Ghost ball gets into the ballpark. And there's 90-90 CTE. They all get you into the ballpark of where you need to possibly uh, where you need to be if you're using them correctly. But when it's all said and done, when you hit that cue ball and the cue ball hits the object ball, whatever you saw was either correct or incorrect. And if it's incorrect, then whatever you saw was not correct. And that's what you're going to have to fix no matter what. And nobody in the world is going to be able to help you figure out how to do that but you. As long as you're willing to say to yourself, yeah, I am not aiming correctly. And then that's what's going to do it from there.
what the heck was I even talking about? I, I think that was even going off of, I think that was going off of Benjamin's um, question to where I, I went off, uh, I started going off on a, on a real tangent <laughs> on being able to shoot straight or aim straight or, 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 or do whatever. And so Benjamin, you're saying I'm making complete sense. So I hope, I hope that uh, helps. And, and anybody else that, that heard that message, like I said, that, that's always the way that I, I, I try to help, uh, help people understand why they're missing their shots. And you can't just say, oh, I missed. You know, first, um, first, um, eliminate all fundamental flaws because then you start focusing on your aim. And then when you start fixing your aim, that's when you start seeing more accuracy. Uh, I, I hope that makes sense. <clears throat> and yes, I like what corner for billiard is saying. Uh, make sure that you're using your, the, the correct dominant eye, uh, when, when you're shooting. So if you're a person where both eyes are functional, because uh, I've made this comparison before, uh, Neil's fine. I think he's blind or partially blind um, in his left eye. That's why you see his cue all, all the way on the right side of his face, because his right eye is his dominant eye, and it's probably the only eye that is processing whatever the heck he's seeing, and then he shoots the shot. But when you do have the ability to use both of your eyes and you have your cue um, uh, under your chin, and most likely, it'll also be kind of off to one side or the other that favors your dominant eye. Now, y'all see, I'm a right-handed player, but I'm left eye dominant. Right? So my cue is kind of slightly on the left side uh, of my chin because my left eye is going to be doing the majority of the processing of whatever it is I'm looking at, while my right eye helps me judge the depth perception at the same time. And Everything that I'm talking about is exactly what I'm doing because, you know, I don't I don't want to say like I have a photographic memory or anything, but that's pretty much what I'm doing to where when I when I shoot my shots, I'm remembering these pictures. I'm remembering the picture that I saw when I make the shot and when I miss the shot, because if I make the shot, that is clearly a picture that I want to remember, because if the same shot comes up again, I do want to create the same picture when I uh, hit the cue ball. But if I miss the shot, I clearly want to remember that picture as well because I don't want to use that picture again. That is literally probably the best aiming advice uh, that I can that I can possibly give through brute force practice after you fix all of your fundamental flaws. Ugh. Okay, so that's all said and done. I am pretty much going to call this a wrap. That pretty much almost put me over to about <laughs> streaming for four hours. So I see that I have about... 55 of y'all left in here. I love the fact that I have 90 likes on here. And I think I saw at one point I must have had up to about um, 100, close to 100 viewers in here, which is amazing. I always love it. I love that we can have these um, interactive uh, discussions. We can have the dialogues to go in between it. And I can only hope that what I'm showing you here on the table uh, when I'm playing my matches, how I break down the matches, how I break down the strategies and everything else, is the way that I play. I always try to practice what I preach and you guys get to see the, the benefits uh, from them. And then of course you get to see the human side of me because I'm not a perfect player. If I was, I'd be a professional. And Lord knows if I'd even have a YouTube channel if, if I was a professional. I always consider myself an average uh, pool player and anybody that's followed me good, uh, well enough knows that I also don't even like to describe myself as a good pool player. I like to describe myself as a decent pool player. I know what I know and I know how to um, implement or I know how to execute what I know. And from what everybody tells me, I know how to teach what I know very well. And that it allows a lot of people to pick up what I'm learning and execute on the table themselves. And that is what I'm most grateful for when I get to see a bunch of, or see a, uh, hear a lot of stories about how people benefit off of my videos, off of my advice or whatever to improve their game by like one or two skill levels, whatever. It's an amazing thing. So thanks everybody for, for being here tonight. Like I said, if you're new to my channel, and this is the first time you've ever seen me live stream, first time you've ever heard the type of advice that I'm giving, first time you've ever seen me shoot or whatever, if you like what you're seeing here, give this live stream a thumbs up, consider subscribing to the channel, click the bell notification icon so that way you're notified whenever I go live or whenever I publish a new video. Until next time, take care everybody.